call the meeting of <clears throat> the Camarillo City Call Council to order and ask for a roll call, please. Councilmember Trimbley? Here. Councilmember Morgan? Here. Councilmember McDonald? Here. Vice Mayor Kildee? Here. Mayor Craven? Here. And I'll call the special meeting of the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Parks District to order. Director Dixon? Here. Director Mishler? Here. Director Magner? Here. Director Kelly? Here. Chairman Malloy? Here. Mishler. Mishler. Director Mishler, could you lead the flag salute, please? Please stand. Hand over heart. Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. okay. Item four. Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District Senior and Community Recreation Center Facility Needs Assessment Study. Final presentation. Draft. Mark, isn't it draft? Presentation. My agenda says final presentation. Apologize. <laughs> no worries. Good evening, <clears throat> Mayor Craven, Director Malloy, Chairman Malloy, Council members, Board members, members of the community. <clears throat> uh, tonight, as Director Malloy, uh, Chairman Malloy had mentioned, this is the final presentation. Um, to give you a little bit of background on how we got here, uh, the City of Camarillo and Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District entered into a cooperative agreement in June of 2017. And each agency agreed to jointly fund the senior and community recreation facility needs assessment study with a total cost of approximately $89,000, each bearing half of that. This study will allow the Pleasant Valley Recreation Park District to determine how its current senior center and recreation facility are meeting the needs of the community and to determine whether or not the district should expand, repurpose facilities, or, in, or add new facilities. The Park District currently manages 28 parks and, and the following facilities, the Senior Center, the Community Center, Freedom Center, and an aqua indoor aquatic center. This study has included an extensive community outreach and feedback, identified potential gaps in senior and community recreation services, determined unmet needs, evaluated current facilities, as well as developed mobile diagrams regarding potential needed space based on community feedback and their needs. It's my pleasure to introduce Tom Deal with Greenplay and Nate Seabach from Mag <coughs> Mogavera Architects who will be going into greater detail regarding the findings of the Senior and Community Recreation Facility Needs Study. And with that, I will turn it over to them. Mary, thank you very much to all the elected officials. Thank you for taking the time to spend with us, all the other staff members and the community that's present. Um, we're going to give a presentation tonight, and then if you have any questions, we'll have some time at the end to address them. So we started back in September. We came here and did what was called a strategic kickoff. These will be some of the pictures that your uh, Recreation and Park District has had over the past few years. So this is the process that we went through. We started off with a startup meeting or a strategic kickoff. Um, we identified things like the critical success factors for the project, what it was exactly that our charge was. <clears throat> we followed that up with information gathering. Myself, another team member, we came here and spent three days, had focus groups, stakeholder meetings, uh, SWOT analysis, site uh, and facility tours. We also did a demographics and trend study. So we did a demographic study specific to your community. And then we did a trend study that looked at recreational trends nationally, regionally, and locally. We also uh, did a community 
um, survey, a needs assessment survey. It was mailed out to over 3,000 random households. And we also had an open link survey. And we'll go into a little bit greater detail about that. We did program and facility analysis. We did program identification. Um, we basically looked at everything that the district was doing. I came back, uh, I believe it was in October, and did a findings presentation. And at that time, we presented what we had learned up to that time, had a visioning session with the liaison committee, and continued to develop the plan. Uh, basically, we've had weekly meetings with Mary over the phone or in person and with the liaison committee pretty much on a monthly basis. <coughs> After all of that, we're at where we are today, which is our final needs assessment presentation. So during information gathering, we had five different focus groups. Those are small meetings, 12 to 15 people. We had 11 individual stakeholder meetings, so that's one-on-one -on -one meetings with stakeholders in the community. Again, we did site and facility tours, um, and we had meetings with both the district staff and the city staff, and meetings with the liaison committee. During our focus group meetings, you can see these are how long people had lived in the community. So we had people that had lived here less than five years, so that's bringing a new perspective. Many people that had been here five to 10 years, 10 to 19 years, and people that had been here over 20 years who had all the history of your community. And we also had people that were non-residents who come in from outside your community to use your facilities and programs. Could I just ask, when you say within the city, you mean within the jurisdiction? Within the community. It's within the park district. Jurisdiction. Okay. Thank park you. District. Thank you. So during the uh, focus group information gathering, this is what we heard. There were needs for areas of improvement for your facilities, that there needed to you know, pay attention. We needed to look at the design, the quantity, the quality, the accessibility. We needed to look at senior and youth programs community spaces, classrooms, gymnasiums, multi-spaces, multi-use spaces, and event spaces. Those were what we heard were the top priorities. As far as program improvement, we heard that you wanted us to look at active recreation, passive recreation, lifelong learning opportunities, cultural arts programs, and health and wellness programs. So that's what we heard from the community during information gathering. So when we did our demographic study, you know, we looked at what your population was, your median age, how, number of households, the income. We also looked at the population growth trends. When we were doing our study at the time that we pulled the data in 2017, there were approximately 77,214 people within the park district boundaries, park district. recreation and park district boundaries. It's anticipated to grow in the next five years to 79,409 or more, and then again to continue to grow each of the next five years. We looked at participation by this, the Recreation and Park District, what activities people participated in. We also looked at <coughs> fitness activities. What were the number one uh, active fitness activity? And for instance, walking for exercise jogging, running, aerobics, weightlifting, all types of things that could occur indoors. We did our study and we looked at national trends and we looked at what baby boomers are doing, what's called the Generation X, the Millennials, and the Generation <coughs> Z. So it gave us kind of a baseline and we looked at that and compared it to how your population in your community was. As far as national trends, 31% of agencies are expanding programming. So communities are expecting more out of their recreation and park districts. And over 96% of agencies, it's more than just parks now. It's recreation and parks. And they're providing activities for sports, fitness, and leisure programs. Some of the top things we're seeing, holiday special events, fitness programs, educational programs, day and summer camps and so forth, adult and senior and older programs, adult sports. So the national trends and part of this study was to look at the senior center and a community center. 
Older adults and seniors are choosing to maintain an active lifestyle, recognizing the health benefits of regular physical activity. With the large number of adults, many communities are finding the need for more programming, more activities, more facilities. So what you're seeing or what we believe we saw in the study is what we're seeing across the country. So some of the fitness trends, the way they've changed in the last 10 years, what people are focusing on now, like I have one of those Fitbits on my arm, wearable technology, body weight training, personal training, group exercise, yoga, exercise, activity. So that's what we had learned up in the information gathering stage and then we did our statistically valid survey. We mailed out the survey to 3,500 surveys were actually mailed out to random homes in the district and we received back 336 of those surveys completed which is it makes the survey statistically valid and we also received another 748 responses of people that went on what was called the open link survey. It was an identical survey, it just didn't have an invitation and it wasn't uh, statistically valid because someone could fill out two. But we compare the two surveys side by side and I'll, I'll show you some of that coming up. But we had a very good response rate <laughs> from all the surveys that we do. So we were comfortable that we heard what the community wanted between the focus groups, the stakeholder meetings, the public meetings and the survey. We feel we have heard from the community. And each thing we heard validated the things we had heard. So what we heard from the survey, the top five things, is that the Recreation and Park District is doing a good job with facilities and parks, so that's a positive. We heard that trails and pathways are highly important. Then we heard that special event space and senior activities are highly desired and that senior programs, youth programs, and special events are important, and that people like the current location. So those were the top five priorities. When we started to look into the survey, the invitation sample, that's the one where someone was mailed a survey and had a code if they went online or they actually filled out the paper. That's the column on the left. The open link is the one where we advertise that you could go online and take the survey and we made paper surveys available in the senior center in the district office. You can see the results were very comparable, which is a positive. Uh, typically, female head of the household was who filled out the survey. We have a nice disbursement of the ages and we have a nice disbursement of whether you have children or don't have children, whether you're married or you don't have married. So we heard from everyone in the, you know, a nice sampling of everyone in the community. We asked questions about whether you live north of 101 or west, you know, north of 101 and west of Arnell Road. And when we spoke to the uh, district, that is similar to the way the district lays out and the way we looked at the demographics. So again, we had a nice dis disbursement of where people filled out the survey. Similar to our focus groups, we had people that have just moved here fill out the surveys and people that have been here a long time. And we had people that owned homes and rented homes and it's similar in proportion to what your demographics are. Here we were asking about the satisfaction and adequacy. And this is about facilities and programs. It was on a one to five scale, one not being satisfied, five being satisfied. So ideally, you'd like to be in the fours, up near five, you don't wanna be one and two, three is kind of average. As you can see, and this is satisfaction, um, community and special events ranked decent. Um, if you look in the middle, adult programs was a little bit lower, the community center was lower, um, senior programs was even lower, senior center was lower, Freedom Gym was lower. So that pointed us to look at those activities in those spaces. <clears throat> the degree to which the facilities met the needs, again on a one to five scale, 
and you can see that the Freedom Gym was lower, the Senior Center was lower, uh, Gymnasium was lower, Community Center. So all those spaces are important but aren't quite meeting the needs of the community. This is a matrix that we put together. Ideally, you want to be like the upper left quadrant is something that is of high importance and doesn't meet the needs. So if something's way off to the left, that's not an ideal thing. In the upper right, it's very important and it's highly meeting the needs. So you can see community and neighborhood parks are highly important and they're highly meeting the needs of the community. You can see that the community center doesn't get up in, the, in that range, so it's not meeting the needs. The senior center is even lower, not meeting the needs. Freedom Gym is outside of that sphere, so it's not meeting the needs. Rental and classrooms are down at the bottom, so that indicates that those spaces and activities aren't meeting the needs of the community. So then we looked at importance of facilities to consider adding, expanding, or improving. Okay? You can see senior activities rated as the highest, 3.7. And special event space rated high, 3.7. Multi-purpose space right in here was 3.4. And right above that, the athletic class or courts, 3.3. So those were some of the things the community said would be important to look at expanding or improving. We asked it in a different way, what were your top three priorities? Senior activities area was a top priority. In the open link survey, so that's the people that had something to say and went out of their way to take that survey. The statistically valid survey, it was still important, 30%. Special events was important. So again, another tool or a metric that we looked at. We asked about, uh, here we're showing you by age groups. Same question, but by age groups. So if you look at the top line to the far right, if you were over 55, you indicated senior activity areas was very important. If you were between 35 and 54, you didn't rate that quite as high, but you rated youth activities higher, possibly because you may have had children in your family. And if you were under 35, same thing. You rated special events and other areas higher because you were kind of focusing in on what was important to you and your family. We asked the same question whether you had kids at home or not. Those that didn't have kids at home rated the senior activity area the highest. Those that had kids at home rated youth activity areas higher. Everything else was pretty consistent. We asked people about if you're not using the district's facilities, where else do you go? So we heard an, a high number of people go to private gyms and clubs mm -hmm. to have that need met. <coughs> What was somewhat concerning down at the bottom, 21% in the open link of your seniors, of, of people are going outside your community to get their senior needs met. 28% are going outside your community to get their youth sports association activities met. So we asked about expanding programs and services, not facilities. And we heard 3.8% on the open link indicated we need to expand senior programs. Adult programs was 3.8. Exercise and fitness classes, 3.7. Health and wellness, 3.7. So again, that kind of was a trend that we saw. So we asked for the top three priorities to add programs and services. Seniors. Programs was the highest in both the invitation and the open link. <clears throat> Exercise and fitness was the second. Youth programs is right there. Health and wellness. So those are the type of programs we repeatedly heard. So we start to see a theme or have trends. We asked the same question, just whether you had children at home or didn't have children at home. If you didn't have children at home, senior programs was higher. If you had children at home, youth programs was higher. We asked about potential funding mechanisms. If the park 
Recreation and Park District was going to do something, how do you think the operations and maintenance of their facilities and programs should be handled? Okay? If you look from neutral, probably support and definitely support, if you add those up, you have 51% of the invitation sample and I believe it's 54% of the open link support some form of a new dedicated property tax. And at the same token, definitely not and probably not, you have 37% and 41% that don't support. So it's kind of a mix. When you talk about user fees, that's where you're paying for the service, whether it's a registration fee, a membership fee, an entrance fee. There was a higher support for that type of mechanism for both surveys. So we asked about if you had a preference if new facilities were going to be considered, is there a location? Approximately 50%, 45 and 49 didn't have a preference, but 50% and 43% <laughs> preferred the current location. So that tells you, tells us that where you are right now is a good location. So basically, up to this point, that's where we had been identifying all of the community needs. That's where we had asked questions about what facilities you needed, what programs were needed and wanted and desired. We asked staff questions, we asked um, elected officials questions, we asked the community questions. So at that point, it's about making sense of the data, we had all the information, and we started to go process it. So what we heard is there is a need and a desire for facility amenities. And if you have facilities, they should be warm, inviting, welcoming. We heard there was a need for dedicated area and <coughs> services for seniors, and that there should be multiple spaces for fitness and educational classes. So the theme there was facilities, amenities, and services. When we were asking about programs and activities, most of what we heard were indoor. So we heard about indoor activities and programs. We heard about special events, senior activities, senior programs, youth programs, more programs, more events, community events. And I put up there your program guides because it's not that the Recreation and Park District isn't doing it. They're just not able to do enough. The community has asked for more. We also heard about lifelong learning and cultural activities. Senior social interaction, affordable meals, cultural activities, social dances. You can read everything that's up there, cooking classes, educational classes. And again, the district is offering that, just not to the level that people want. We talk to people that, you know, attempt to put on dances and aren't able to put them on as often as they want or have different programs. They can have them now and again, but not as often as they would like. So then we started asking or looking at active recreation programs. So we heard people indicating a need for pickleball, lawn bowling, basketball, ping pong, bocce ball, badminton, volleyball, indoor soccer, fitness classes, all types of things that would occur ideally inside a facility. And again, I popped up the program guides because the district is doing some of these, just not all of them and not to the level that we heard the community needs, desires, and wants. Same with youth programs, child care programs before and after school, outdoor basketball, board and video games. Again, the community or the district is doing some of those just not to the level that the community has expressed that they'd be satisfied with. Doing research, these are activities in 2016 that the district had requests to do and they were able, not able to do them. So they denied these activities due to lack of facility space. So people came and wanted to do a bridge tournament, book club, drop in basketball, you can read all of those. Many, many activities that people were asking to do that the district could not accommodate. 
So some of the benefits of recreation and park programs and facilities that we wanted to make sure you were aware of. If it's affordable and accessible, it's going to help with health issues. By being active, it helps combat chronic disease. It diminishes the risk of chronic disease, helps you with heart disease, can increase your life expectancy. Uh, it builds self-esteem, pr promotes sensitivity. One of the greatest things about a recreation and park district is a social interaction. If people have a place to go and socialize, they live longer and they're happier and they're more active. It can boost the economy as well, can even increase tourism. So there's a list of reasons why recreation and park programs and facilities are important. So currently, we looked at everything and your facilities have limitations. Right now, your auditorium and your gymnasiums are used above the optimal capacity. Nate and I toured the facilities again today, and the auditorium is set up for an event not today. So people can't use the auditorium today because it's set up for a future event. We were over in the senior center, and there were people everywhere, and people couldn't do everything they wanted to do. Right now, it's impractical to expand your programming because you don't have any place to put them. Your classrooms are full, your auditorium's full, your senior center's full. And use of the Freedom Gym is really a short-term situation. Access could be terminated at any time. There's issues with the facility itself. There's issues with access. There's issues with the parking lot. The existing senior center is really maxed out. There's just no more room. They're doing everything they can to use it and program it, but there's not enough space. So we were charged with looking at different solutions to meet the community's demand for programs and facilities. So we came up with three different possible plans. Plan one was to have no new facilities to renovate and or repurpose the existing facilities. And we're going to talk about these in a moment. Plan two was to have new facilities that would include the facility elements needed to expand or enhance programs to address the majority of identified indoor community desires and needs. So the majority of them, but not all of them. And then plan three was new facilities, which would include all the facility elements that you might need to address all of the identified community desires and needs and position the district to perform well into the future. So to predict for those next five years, 10 years, 15 years when your population is going to grow. So we evaluated the different options and no decisions have been made about what a facility is going to look like or how it's going to be laid out or any of those things. But when we looked at plan one, which was taking your existing facilities and trying to rent them or repurpose them, in our professional judgment, you're not going to gain any additional programming space. It will be costly, and it's not in the best interest of the district. You can put a lot of money into your existing facilities, but you're not going to have anything other than cosmetics. You're not going to be able to have more programs or more spaces. Your six classrooms, seven classrooms, whatever you do to them, there's still going to be seven of them. The senior center would still be the senior center. We looked at plan two. That would result in gaining additional programming space. The concern is it would not meet the needs of all of the community, and it wouldn't prepare you for five, ten years down the road. <coughs> plan three, we believe, would result in gaining the additional programming space that you need. It would meet all of the community needs and desires that were identified. And it most likely would be in the best interest of the district. And again, just before Nate start, no decisions have been made. That's not a picture of exactly what's going um, to happen. Excuse me. Could you Come speak into the mic? I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, we have people watching at home on TV, too. I, did, I forgot that. So, again, 
there's no decisions been made that that's exactly what something's going to look like or that as we go through some of the potential concept diagrams that that is exactly what's happened. They're all concepts. So I'm going to go into some of the more, uh, some of the detailed plan three options. Could you speak right, right, right into the, the microphone, yeah. please? Thanks. I'm going to go in some detail of the plan three option. Um, I'm going to start with a review of some of the building elements that were considered a high priority. Then I'll get into the budget and next steps of the project. So first of all, the lounge. Um, here's a couple lounge environments that we've designed. Um, the lounge is just, think of it as a, a large living room environment. Maybe it's somewhere you um, relax and wait for another member of your party. Perhaps, you know, there's a big TV and, you know, you watch the Super Bowl or the Oscars. It's just a nice place to relax. Another high party was a special event space. Um, the special event space would be able to be configured in many different ways and perhaps be able to be subdivided into two smaller rooms. The event space would be likely associated with a cafe or other type of food function, so it can be um, so it could host a large meal or perhaps function <coughs> as a cafeteria during the middle of the day. A gymnasium would be able to support a large variety of sports um, and fitness classes. The gym would be able to support different age groups and different activities. You could have basketball, volleyball, yoga, all in the same um, facility. So the size of the gym would be roughly based on two basketball courts. The classrooms are another space that would have movable furniture. So it could be configured in a wide variety of ways and have flexibility. Perhaps the different classrooms are supported uh, Two different functions are supported by the same classroom. So you have one class using it in the morning and they have their own uh, bank of uh, lockable cabinets and then a different class uses the same space at night and they have their own uh, bank of lockable cabinets. So you want to maximize the use of each space so that you don't overbuild the facility. Each room should be used as much as possible throughout the day. So here's just some other examples of classroom, different classroom layouts. So as the community offers more services, you have to realize that consideration should be realized. Uh, you have to add more space to house those various functions. So as you add services, the building needs to grow. So this is a summary of the plan three um, these spaces are just based on industry standards. We have to uh, determine with the community exactly um, what the space size would be appropriate for this community. But this is just a starting point for us to start to envision how this would take shape. So we took that previous matrix and translated it into a graphical diagram to get a sense of uh, the spaces and get a sense of room sizes in comparison to each other. And you see we divided them up into categories, lobby, this senior and youth wings, um, the gym space. You could see the circulation is the large rectangle on the bottom right and how much space that the circulation actually takes up of the space. So we then arranged those program elements into a diagram to get a sense of scale and proportion about how this space might lay out. So I want to stress this is not a floor plan, right? We don't know what the building is going to look like yet. This is, think of this more of a chart or a diagram than a floor plan. So we have to, again, we have to see if we've captured all the spaces that the community wants. And, uh, you know, perhaps the senior wing and the youth wing end up sharing facilities. But right now we have this diagram as all the spaces having their individual component. Okay. I'd like to just back one slide. On this slide, what's important to, to recognize, we've given different colors to primary spaces. Like you'll see the seniors are in a purple color. What we would have liked to have been able to do, but it just can't be done graphically, is to show that the seniors would also have access to the gymnasium, the auditorium, and all the classrooms. And then when you look at the youth, it would be the same thing. The youth happens to be in the white color. They also have access to the gymnasium the auditorium and all the classrooms. And if you look at, you know, whatever group it is, it's an, 
being considered an all-in-one facility so you'd have access to all the different spaces. We just haven't figured out how to show that graphically. You know, we, down the road we'll be able to have colors pop up and back, but we couldn't do that. So this is a diagram to check to see how the program would fit on the existing site. And you see we have plenty of room. Um, again, don't think of this as a floor plan. You know, this building could be one story, it could be two stories. Maybe it's a, a bunch of buildings and broken up. Um, to get a sense of proportion, you can see the dark dash lines. It's an outline of the existing facility. So the existing facility is about, what, 21,000 square feet. And the new Plan 3 facility would be about three times that size. So looking at the two possible solutions, again, Plan 2 would meet the majority of the expressed and desired community needs. And Plan 3 would meet all of those needs that we heard and position the district well into the future. So here are two, looking at the two potential solutions side by side, Plan 3 is in the black and Plan 2 is in the red. And the way we got to Plan 2 was removing some of the elements in Plan 3 or reducing their size. And this is all subjective. Absolutely no decision has been made. It was an exercise to show that to get down to plan two, for instance, in this scenario, and we have lots of them we could show you, in this scenario, the youth wing doesn't have any space at the moment, nor does family services. The classrooms, the number of them have been reduced. The fitness space, the group exercise rooms have been reduced. So in order to get to the plan two, you lose space. And if you lose space, you'd lose potential programming and activities. And again, absolutely no decision's been made. This was just to show how that exercise could be done. So at this time, looking at everything, our recommendation is to build a new senior and community recreation center at the current location. It provides an exceptional recreation experience, or it would, it's an all-in-one location, so community members could go there and do multiple things. Um, it's property that's currently owned by the district, and it would maximize operational efficiency. One set of staff could manage everything. Maintenance is in one place. People going to use the facility are going to one place. So we're recommending that plan three would be the recommended plan. So here's a conceptual budget for Plan 3, and it's very hard to read. Um, That's probably good. I'll, you don't want us to know how much it costs? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the numbers. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry that it's this small. But um, again, this is this is be for Plan 3, um, and you know, this is a starting point. So right now, we worked with a cost estimator to work out this budget. So what we did is we allocated um, square footage for each of the various areas, and we allocated an estimated um, low cost per square foot and a high cost per square foot. And we came to the median of, uh, of those spaces. And so the, um, the project or the building cost for just the building we're estimating at 32,400,000. So then you would add the site costs. Now the site costs, we haven't really looked into the site much at all. Um, so there's a really big delta. Um, we've, I think some of the low numbers are 100 million to, I'm sorry, 1 million. That's <laughs> <laughs> 1 million to 2 million. And so we're, we're pretty big on the, uh, the delta on the site costs. Um, so you add up the building costs in the site cost and that gets to 35,400,000. Then um, we need to add a construction contingency. So we're assuming that this facility wouldn't start construction for another three years. 
and uh, historically construction costs go up every single year. So at a guesstimate of 5% per year, we add 15% and that's another $5 million. Then you have to add uh, soft costs. So soft costs are a very significant part of every development that people that aren't familiar with the development process, you know, just aren't familiar with. So soft costs include um, design fees, um, city fees, um, you know, bank fees, um, all the, you know, accountants, lawyers, all the different fees, all the different things that are required that make up about 30% of the construction budget of a typical project. So it's a very significant part and you should be aware of that up front. Um, and so 30%, so we're estimating the soft cost to be about $12 million Jesus for plan three. Christ. Then finally, we are estimating off of some colored rectangles off of a piece of paper, right? We don't know if this is one story, two stories. We don't know what the building envelope is. We don't know what the structural system is, the mechanical system yet. So we need to add in a fudge factor. So at the bottom, you'll see there's a, it's, when you look at it up close, there's a 10% contingency. <laughs> yeah, there's a 10% contingency that's added for that fudge factor. Now, as we develop the project together, as we get into schematic design and start getting into construction documents and the project takes shape, that contingency will go down. And then eventually when you get you know, the hard bid from the contractor, you won't have that contingency. So you add all these up together, and a grand total at the bottom is 52,500,000. Now, this is a very big number. And again, this was based on you know, a very rough estimate of plan three. Um, you know, obviously, the community, we need to decide you know, if, we wanna, if, if you want to spend $52 million or if you want to do something less. And what we were charged with was to find a range, okay? This is the high range. That's mm -hmm. doing everything in plan three. We believe that somewhere between 30 or 35 million and 50 or 55 million is where you could build the type of facility that would meet the needs of the community. Right, somewhere between plan two or plan three. And we're too preliminary to be able to put an exact figure on that because like the gymnasium that is considered, has that got a wooden floor or a synthetic floor? The classrooms that are considered, you know, are they dividable and are they dividable with acoustical div dividers? You know, all those decisions were not there yet, but what we've been able to do is, is figure out what the community is asking for in the way of needs, in the way of programs, and what that translates to in facilities, and then what the approximate square footage would be, and what a, a, a price range would be, okay? So we looked at, the other thing that is very important to consider, there's not only building a facility, but then there's maintaining and operating it. So we looked at what the annual maintenance and operation costs would be for the sample plan three. So we looked at staffing, we looked at contractual services, we looked at the commodities, and then we looked at the potential revenue. Revenue through passes, if there were memberships for any portion of a facility, program fees, rental fees, recreation programs, and we looked at that and we believe that if plan three was built that it could be operated and you would need a subsidy, annual subsidy of about $241,000. So right now, operating uh, with the guidance from the district of how you'd like to operate the facilities, you could recover about 66% of your annual costs. And that can be tweaked up and down depending on your pricing philosophies that you would choose and depending on what amenities ended up in a facility. Okay, okay so uh, what's next? Well, step one is for you to map out the decision-making method with 
is, is the city, the district, or another entity um, going to be making decisions? And one way to help with that is to assign a project champion. So a project champion would be an individual that would have direct communication with the design team and the contractor. The project champion would be making final decisions um, based you know, on all the different stakeholders of the community. So just think of that person as a conduit from all of you, the entire community, to the design team. So this could be a full-time position, and uh, it's, I, I, I can't uh, under, overstress the importance of that role. Uh, next, we need to establish the permitting process. We would meet with the planning department, the building department, and see what the um, administrative process would be and establish a target schedule together. Step two was the program development. So we've uh, worked and figured out what the community wants for the program. Now we have to figure out exactly what those spaces are. So we, could, we would do that through community workshops. So for example, the art room, does it have sinks? Does it have cabinets? Does it have a kiln? All these different decisions that have a big impact on the design and the cost of the space. So you know, we could go back to the office and start doing this ourselves, but without community input, it won't, we wouldn't, you wouldn't get what you want. So it's really important to have a lot of community input early on in the process. So step three is site analysis. This is when the design team would review the opportunities and constraints of the existing site. Step four, we would develop three different concepts to, to present to the community and discuss the pros and cons of each scheme. So perhaps we have a scheme that's two stories, perhaps we have another scheme that's one story, perhaps we have a scheme where the building are broke up in a, broken up into you know, separate, separate parts of, of the site. And then we would pre again present these to the community and narrow these down in community workshops to one final scheme. Again, it's much more efficient to have extra communication in these early stages than it is to realize that we had done something wrong and, go, and come back. So after those concepts, we would uh, develop one final schematic design. So that schematic design would, you know, when you really start to see the buildings take place, we would have the mechanical systems, the structural systems, the sustainability systems, all the different systems selected. Um, you would have floor plans, elevations, some nice renderings to look at. Um, the schematic design could be used when you're asking the community for funding. You know, it's really important when you're, when you're asking in the community for funding that people have something tangible to look at and to share and to get excited about. So up to this point, um, we're, it's, it's a, probably at least a 12-month process. But we, you know, we would have to discuss, a big issue would we have to discuss with the planning department and the building department to figure out what their processes are. Then after uh, we have a schematic design, um, it's time for funding. And Tom's going to talk a little bit more about the funding. In the process that Nate just talked about, the fact that there's a team between the district and the city, some of that time frame might change because of the relationship with permitting and different things. Those are things that we don't totally know at this time. But once you get to the point of having a design of exactly what you're looking to do and can get a firmer cost, then you start looking at funding mechanisms. There's many different options, and I've listed several of them here, whether they're bonds and fee charges, assessment through the district, community enhancement funds. If you look at advertising and naming rights, that's a great way to go about it, fundraising, uh, partnerships, sponsorships. There's at times grants available. You can look at joint use agreements and program restructuring. And you still would want to look at program and facility repurposing possibly. So then step seven, um, assemble a design team and select a contractor and we would help you determine a delivery method for the construction. Uh, 
step eight is for us to, the design team, to go back and complete the construction documents and uh, submit the building for permit and get a building permit. Um, step nine and 10 is selecting the contractor and the construction. We're estimating, um, you know, for a plan three option, construction would be somewhere about 18 months. And then uh, step number 11 is the best step of all, the grand opening. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, just, just for the, so the audience knows what the format is here, I'm going to ask for questions for the, for the consultants from the council and from the board. Then we'll have uh, public comment. And then the board members and the council members will make statements about the, the proposal itself. So I'll start with the uh, council members. Is there a council member who'd like to start the questioning? Kevin, go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Um, how did you come up with your cost per square foot uh, for this? And I know that there's different costs depending upon what potentially could be built, but how did you come up with those type of actuaries? We hired a cost estimator to work with us, and the cost estimator just worked with their experience in industry standards. And if you uh, look at the detail breakdown in your report, you'll see for each space, there'll be a low cost per square foot, a low dollar amount per square foot, and a high dollar amount per square foot. And that's because we don't, you know, there's so many unknowns right now. We don't know what the finishes are and whatnot. So at this point, this is just the, um, the, the cost estimators, you know, mm -hmm. educated uh, estimate. Okay, thanks. Um, in looking at what you've proposed, because one of them is very, a uh, lot to it, and it'll be it'll leaving a lot behind, you know, for us to have in the community. But did you have any kind of a phasing uh, element that could be put into this instead of all being done at once? Yes, that was, um, it's highlighted in the different sections of the next steps. That's when a decision would be made. But the facility could be considered to be phased. You could build, for instance, uh, the senior center and the classrooms first, or mm -hmm. the gymnasium and the classrooms. You know, there's different ways that that could be done. Um, again, depending on how it's done, there could be some additional cost just because of the timing. But that that definitely could be done. And until you really know exactly each space, it's it's hard to do that. But there's many examples of that. We've done other projects where they've been phased in. All right. And that that would be a decision you would like to make relatively early on, and then we could design that into, you know, into the schematic design and all the way through. And so it's mm -hmm. planned what's going to start first and second. Mark, I have one. Can I yeah, just go ahead, Kevin? Just one follow-up. Yeah. Um, the existing structures that are on the site now, would they be all torn down or will it be some that you, can, you could use as well? We believe the existing senior center is a outlived its life expectancy and that's a difficult one in in walking around today with Nate the auditorium space would be potentially something that could be considered to be reused or built around the you know one of the issues is bringing all of those up to current mechanical standards current code and all of that would be potentially very expensive so that's something that as you're going through the next step and actually finishing the design, you would make those decisions because in some instances it could cost more to renovate what's there than to just replace it. But the current classrooms and the current senior center didn't really look like things that could be reused or repurposed very easily. The auditorium potentially the office administration space, it's where it is, it's kind of possibly in the way, and its reuse would be limited height and so forth. It's just not a great space, my opinion. And then, you know, perhaps when we are doing the um, early concepts, maybe one of the concepts is, you know, keeping the existing facilities, and then we do two concepts where we don't. And so I think that's something that we'll have to learn about and work through. Did you have an opportunity to look at any of the parking, or is this way preliminary for that? It's pretty preliminary for that. Um, 
I don't, and I think that's uh, the part. It's probably not that much of a significant factor, cost-wise and program-wise, to um, making decisions on. But again, if there's other um, items that we learn about that, you know, we'll definitely take into account. Thank you, Mark. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I have three questions. Uh, first of all, what is the square footage of the current senior center? Two thousand three hundred. No. Everything that they have over there, everything that the district has is 21,800. The current senior center, I believe, 20,000. Yeah, it was three to three. Just 4,000. Just approximately 4,000 square feet. Okay, so I guess I have a tag on question because if it's way, way, way too small, as we've been hearing, adding 1,800 square feet isn't that much more. Right. And that's not what we've done. We've added 1,800 square feet to a dedicated space that would be for seniors, but there's an additional uh, 40,000 square feet that's right there that would also be accessible and part of what the seniors would use. Instead of, now they try it, like I was over there this afternoon, there was a gentleman doing wee bowling next to somebody who was just chatting next to other people that were playing cards. In the expanded new facility, the Wii Bowling could occur in a group exercise room, it could occur in a, in a classroom, it could occur in the senior multi-purpose space, it could occur in the gymnasium. So in the plan that we've shown, and again, it's not a footprint, it's just a concept, seniors would have access currently to 16 different classrooms three different group exercise spaces, two court gymnasium. So it's just walking down the hall and all of that is there. That's As opposed to across the courtyard. Or right now, when they walk across the courtyard, they have access to seven classrooms. Seniors cannot walk to a gymnasium. Seniors can't walk. Wait, I don't understand why Right now, they can't I'm, walk to a, I'm not trying to be argumentative, I'm, I'm trying to understand because it's close. The gymnasium that you currently have is the Freedom Center. So you could not walk from the Senior Center to the Freedom Center. And I'm not okay. be, but they can walk over to the classrooms, yes. So what they can currently walk to is seven classrooms and the auditorium. The auditorium quite often is not available and there isn't really truly a group exercise space. I had a meeting this morning with some people in a room that right before me was yoga, and then we used it as a meeting space. So it's being used for multiple purposes, but the floor wasn't really appropriate for yoga, and all of the space wasn't really appropriate for a meeting. It's just being used to the best of their abilities. Okay, my next question is, um, at one point you said that the current facility was outdated and really should be torn down. So if it were torn down and something else built, how long would the whole site be offline? Mm -hmm. Again, it would depend on whether the entire facility is built all at once or phased. And we're not at that point that that decision can be made because we don't know exactly what you're going to build. But your current site, center and buildings doesn't take up your entire site. So theoretically, you could build a large portion of your new facilities on the space that isn't the current space and some of those could continue to operate. There's other instances where, for instance, something like the senior center, you bring in a portable facility for a period of time on the edge of the property and you switch from the current senior center into the portable facility, well, that is being built. Or you use portable <laughs> classrooms, or you use portable spaces for the office. So everything, there's a potential that everything could continue to function. Would it be slightly different? Yes. What we find when you go into communities, it feels painful while you're doing it, but then after that grand opening and everything, everybody has forgotten about that and is so excited to have all the new spaces and programs. Uh, my third question is uh, about the cost, and I feel, and I realize there was a subcommittee, and I suppose that sometime they'll be asked to, to give us their perspective or their reasoning or whatever, but I feel uh, 
cheated in not being told the costs of Plan 2. I realize that you didn't like it or somebody didn't like it, but I feel that it would have been good to have given the rest of us the, some comparisons. It's not that we didn't like Plan 2. Plan 2 will need more input as to is taken out of Plan 3. And like for me to just make the arbitrary decision that there's not going to be a youth center or that instead of 16 classrooms, you're going to have eight. We didn't feel the liaison committee, I believe, and myself and everyone involved didn't feel that was the right way to go. I can... So there was no cost associated with Plan 2? There's a, again, there's a range between 30 or 35 million, 50 to 55 million to build Plan three or plan two. That's in the range somewhere. If, if the liaison committee would like me to take a little bit more of a look at that, that's something we can discuss. Okay, those are all my questions. Thank you, Sean. Um, Tony. Ah, the mic. Can you get back on the slide? I have a couple of process questions. I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with my own version of sticker shock, and I think everybody is, and okay. Um, well, I use that term advisedly. But in any event, is it possible to go back on the, I have some process, qu I have some process questions. Um, it, it, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, the next steps on, you had to head back. Okay, so we've got um, even before the recommended next steps. So those first two and then the next one, the administrative groundwork and design program development. And then there's a the third step, uh, which is in the materials um, and, and the fourth step. During the building concept phase under step four and during and bringing the slide back two slides um, under the design program development phase, isn't that where the, from a process standpoint, isn't it where that, that's where the rubber really meets the road in terms of carving out what is going to, what is going to occur in terms of facility, uh, in terms of the facility? Exactly. And then I have a follow-up question. Exactly, yeah. So step two is developing, you know, the program. So when the program's finished, the program will have all the spaces that the, that the center will have and a detailed um, room data sheet, if you will, of each of the various spaces. So that's, you know, and that would be in kind of a matrix form, not something graphical. And there would probably be, you know, estimated square footages for each of those. So yeah, that you're right. Step two is, is kind of where the rubber meets the road and you, and you, and you finalize that project program. And then after you do your site analysis, um, the building concept is where we would take that program and develop three different concepts. So perhaps one concept is saving the original buildings and adding on to them. You know, and a second concept may be demolishing the buildings. And then a third concept may be, you know, something different, a two-story building perhaps. But all those three concepts would be based on the same program document and have about the same square footage in the same spaces. And is it fair to say that in both items two and four, there will be, there is a uh, cost refinement exercise yes. in each of those phases? So you, you, know, you start here and you slowly start, I want to say winnowing down, but that's in essence that's what exactly we're talking right. about here. Well, winnowing down through, and, and both phases involve community workshop and community workshops and transparency, right? In terms of everyone knows what is going on. Extensive community workshops in those two. That's where it's really, really important to maximize community input. In your professional experience, are those the two toughest phases from a process standpoint? Because people are trying, I'm, I'm leaving aside financing, I'm leaving aside options, I'm leaving aside how in the world are we gonna pay for all this? Yeah. But just from a crunch time standpoint, is that the most difficult? It, it is a difficult uh, spot, and, and I go back to the project champion. You know, you need to assign somebody that's basically, at some point there's going to have to be a decision made, right? This group wants A, this group wants B, they don't agree. The project champion is going to have to give direction 
to the design team this is this is you know we're we're going forward so that's a really important position well that's a, a fault can I keep going? That, that's a follow-up. That's another follow-up that I had, and, and, and I'm, I'm intrigued by the term project champion, and that connotes a number of different things. But here you've got you know two entities, two public entities that are that are working together uh, on this. In your experience in other jurisdictions, who's been the project champion, and, and how do you how do you juxtapose that? in a circumstance such as this, where you've got multiple entities that are, and, and a whole community that's trying to work together. Right, right. well, it, it's, it's been uh, all over the map. We've had project champions where, you know, it's, it's somebody that, that's been, uh, I guess, nominated, that's not an elected official. Sometimes an elected official will, you know, step up. But yeah, that's, as you're alluding to, those initial um, phases is where you know the project champion, the design team, the community have to work together to try to find consensus where the most people um, get mostly what they want. Right? There's gonna, like anything, right? There's obviously gonna be compromise, but the more community input you have, hopefully, most people are happy. And then also, when it comes to funding, you want to have as much community input as possible because people feel like that they've been heard. Maybe they, you know, in our experience, um, maybe not everybody gets what they want, but if people have been heard, it goes a long way. And so it, it's really important to just have a lot of communication at those early stages. Right, and that's a functioning of not only identifying the financing options, right, but also the community identifying for itself what can it afford, mm -hmm. you know, from, from a reasonableness standpoint. One last question, and that is, one last, one last question, and that is, um, if you take these steps just from a time standpoint and bookend them, what are we talking about, reasonably speaking, in your professional experience in terms of the number of months? I know it's going to be years, but I'm trying to think about what this is. Are we talking about somewhere between 48 to 60 months or 36 to 60 months? I mean, what is a reasonable expectation Based on your, in the, if we follow this process, based on your professional experience, yeah, it's somewhere four years, something around that. Um, a significant part uh, is the planning department, and a lot of times projects can um, be with the planning department for nine months, just depending Easy. on all the various, um, you know, approvals. If you need an EIR, um, so that that's a big factor. And then phasing is a, is a really big factor. You know, just like a freeway, right? If you need to keep a lane open, it, it takes a lot longer to, to do it than to just close the whole thing down and do it. So, so fa phasing is a, uh, is a big factor in timeline. Okay, thank you. And thank I just you. wanted to follow up on your question about um, the steps and how you can whittle things down. During each of those steps, you're bo both looking at what spaces you need and then you'll also be looking at what type of finishes they have. So, you know, decisions will be made, are all these spaces going to occur? And then also, is it gonna be the, you know, uh, tile floor and beautiful rock wall, or is it going to be a linoleum floor? You know, and those type of things, there's a process, and it's also, there's a value engineering part that comes in that, so you can, have control of that. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I, I don't have a lot of questions at this time. Having served on the liaison committee, I've got to ask my questions as we've, we've moved along here. And um, I will tell you, I'm a lot calmer today because I've had a chance to fall off my chair when I saw the, the price, and I've gotten back up, and I say, okay, now let's figure it all out. Um, it's an ex one of the reasons we looked at wanted to look at the whole is we wanted to see the big ground picture. Now it's the tough part's going to be figuring out exactly what we do. So, it's it's a long process, but it's um, you know a process that we all ought to do together to figure out what's best. So, at the moment, I have no questions, but I'm sure we all will as we work through this. Okay, Tom. Anybody, Mark, else? Mike. When we first built this building as a teen center. Way back, and Mr. Ghost and I represent our city council with the Park and Rec. You're referring to the senior center building. Yes, I'm talking about the senior center that was supposedly going to be a teen center. Um, it did, after a couple of years, it didn't work out and turned into the senior center. One of the goals of that 
plan, as I recall from a <laughs> long time ago, was uh, as it grew, as we grew, that building would be expanded to the side, you know, to the back, on, over that open area. Um, and to what extent, we don't know. We didn't, we said they'd look at that in years coming. Uh, is that part of this kind of thing too, one of the choices you have of expanding this building? I mean, it could be significant back. Yeah. The first time when uh, Nate's partner Renner came and we looked at all the facilities, mm -hmm. he did an assessment of the different facilities and his st statement at the time, for instance, like the senior center, if that was to be added onto the cost of what you would have to do to the existing senior center to bring it up to code, to meet all of today's codes as far as width of doorways, ADA access, you know, everything, sprinkler systems, fire systems, mechanical systems, would be most likely more costly than to replace that space. When we looked at it again today, there are some things like some of the uh, structural beams that support the roof <laughs> potentially are looking like some of them are beginning to rot and things like that. So that, that would, you know, the, the opinion of everyone on our team that looked at that was that you'd be spending a significant amount of money to fix what existed and you would gain no space there and then you'd be spending more money to add on to it. If that answers your question. It does and it doesn't because uh, that's a significant uh, amount of structure there that is in good shape, not just that roof we're talking about, but that is workable. And to say tear it down and put a whole new thing in, I don't see how you can beat the cost of keeping what you've got and then f uh, fixing what you have. Yeah, I mean, you make a good point. I don't think we can make that conclusion right now. Yeah. And um, that I just want to stress when we go into, you know, the conceptual design and we come up with, you know, this two or three or four different options, um, sounds like one of those options should be um, keeping that existing facility and um, as Mr. Tremblay alluded to uh, you know we'll be doing updated cost estimates and perhaps we could do a cost estimate of that version at, of that scheme at that time and see oh wait does, does it actually make sense or figure out no it doesn't make sense so that's something that I think we all need to keep an open mind about so we are gonna look and see if that's because before I heard something different I heard it we'll, cost we'll, more to tear it down and Anyway, go ahead. We'll look at whatever mm -hmm. the community wants us to look at. So um, we, I don't want to rule anything out. I don't want to make a, you know, we haven't made any decisions yet on anything. I don't make decisions. Are there any more questions from the council? Okay. Board members. Uh, Mike, would you like to start? Yeah, I'll start. Um, just to clarify, this is our final presentation for this report. But this is a draft report, correct? What this is, it's the final presentation for the needs assessment study, okay? And this, what you have is a draft report. So if we hear back through the liaison committee that there's some edits or refinements that you'd like us to make, we will still address those. So we can still put that, because we haven't gotten to the final report yet. I'm just okay. clarifying that. Okay, thanks. On the 21, of the existing 21,800 square feet at the complex today you're talking about, how much of that is actual off? We have our office headquarters space over there. Does that include office space, or that includes only the classrooms, the senior center, and the auditorium? The, the largest space you have is either the offices or the auditorium. But uh, again, that's not my the, question. The 21,800 does include all of those offices. Oh, okay, okay. So all the office space that we have over there today is included in that number. That was my question for that. And then I just want to follow up. Oh, okay. I have a minor point, and you can see it on some of these slides. Uh, on pages seven and eight of the draft document, there are some presentations and diagrams that you displayed here. I, I have three lenses in my glasses, right? I, no matter what lens I use, I can't read any of that data on those pages seven and eight because the, the, it's not. But if you can bring up the document and go to seven and eight. If you, if you, I have the report on a digital file I brought with me. I have the report right here. Just give me a second. Well, I want to show the audience what I'm talking about. If uh, Megan can bring up pages seven and eight of the document. But what I'm saying is this for the final, final document, you need to present whatever you present has to be readable. And I, no matter how I blew this up, 
If you go to, well, okay, those are mine. You can go to mine or whatever. Well, this is the. I had a. I brought a copy of the actual document. If you want to bring that up, or you have it. No, this is your presentation. Right. The final document. When you actually get the final document, those diagrams and things that we had to put on one eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper now would be put on an eleven by seventeen. That would fold out. Yeah, that's, that's just a minor question. I just want to clarify that the final document will actually have readable information on it, because I couldn't read any of that information on pages seven and eight in, in the in the current document. And the last thing I want to do is follow up on an item that. Oh, there you go. See, uh, this here you can almost read, but if you go into the document itself, you can't read any of that stuff. Um, I want to follow up on what Kevin was talking about for parking, and you kind of just went through it real quick. Um, one of my concerns for any site is the parking requirements. And I know we have activities at our, with our existing facilities. Our parking lot is sometimes completely full and we have overlap. We have parking going out onto all the streets and stuff there. So even without the 61, you know, you're, you're, without your proposal of adding all that additional stuff, we have parking issues today. So to me, I would like to see in your final report some just rough estimates on parking, what the current parking demands are for different items, like a gym or an auditorium, and you know you can so we can add and divide them up, and then some projected numbers. If we move Freedom Gym over to here or build a new gym or something, and look at those numbers, because that's going to be a severe because we may not be able to use that site, and you know, and if we have to go to a three or you know a two-story parking structure, we need to know that because that's going to be a heavy impact on our cost, right? When you look at the slide that's up there now, that was meant to be a, a fit to see if everything that we were, let me finish, proposing the spaces were put side by side, would they fit in the space? And you can see there's a lot of space left. In reality, a gymnasium typically is a two-story space. So most likely, a lot of those other things would also become two stories because you already have a two-story space. So they would go on top of each other. We did look at approximate parking and the opinion at the time is there could be adequate parking there. We didn't believe at the time it would need to be a two. Well, I'm, I'm proposing that the final document have at least a rough estimate of parking demands and stuff. Because I have no vision. I, while well, you're, you're saying we have more space, I don't want to turn all that lawn. We do a lot of activities out there on that lawn space, on the green space besides the parking. And if, if you're to meet the parking requirements means that we have to put asphalt completely around this structure. We're going to have a lot of issues and problems within the community, I think. So I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that's an important component that should be part of this decision making up front right. to even know if this site's possible to use or not. We will take a look so, at that, but I'm, I can't promise that we can tell you how much parking is going to be needed for a, a theoretical space. Well, you should be. For example, we we, we can uh, based on you know the estimate and the square footage is we can go back and look at standards and, yeah. and come up with an estimated parking and and we can do that. And we did kind of go over the site quickly. We were focusing on the spaces, but as you're alluding to, the site is you know as important as the building itself, and it's a significant part of the design. And so feedback like this will definitely have significant influence on the overall design. Okay. And one the, for the people. People, most of the people here may know that, but I mean the park side, they know this. When we built our Pleasant Valley sports com field, sp sports complex, there's a lot of field space there for soccer fields and everything, but there isn't enough parking space. So if ASO puts on a soccer tournament for the weekend, uh, there's enough field space for 160 teams per weekend to come in and play soccer there on the field space. But the parking can only handle about 115 teams. So here we have all that field space and the limited parking on site and the surrounding city streets only allow us to put in about 100. We have to restrict the number of teams coming in to about 115. So I don't want to be in a position where we build a, a large complex that's very expensive, tens of millions of dollars, and then we can only use part of the facility at a time because we don't have enough parking to meet the whole, to use the whole facility. So, I mean, those are, there's obvious reasons there, and we just meet, need a quick first pass. Obviously, these aren't going to be the final numbers, but I'd just like to see that in the final report. Thank you. You have no other questions, Mike? I, I, I will when we get back to the, um, yeah, I got eight pages later, but right now I'm okay. Okay, okay. Dr. Dixon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, I just, I, I'm on the liaison committee, and this is a, uh, something that we discussed uh, briefly, but I, I would, I'd like to, for you to make a comment for the public. Uh, we, we discussed the difference between uh, the, the uh, cost difference and the size difference between plans three and plans two. And the, the slide we showed up there shows that plan two is approximately 20% smaller than plan three. But it, could you comment on the, on the associated cost savings would that would not would I, my understanding is that you would not realize a 20% cost savings by reducing the co the construction space by 20%. Is that is that accurate or not? Yeah, it's accurate. I mean, it, it it'd be close, but um, as buildings get smaller, the cost per, per square foot tends to go up because you have some of the um, you know the base systems. You know, you have your mechanical and and your fire sprinklers, and you have you know you always have your bathrooms, your lobby, and and things like that, and so. As a building gets bigger, you know, you get a little bit of economies of scale. So um, it will it will shrink, but not exactly proportionally. You know, the cost to the square footage. Okay. And it would also depend on which spaces you changed, renovated, and or eliminated. Because some that's the tough thing in, at this stage with the estimate. Not every space costs the same per square foot. You know, there's a difference to build a gymnasium than there is to build a classroom, than there is to build an auditorium. You know, there's a specific cost for a restroom. Office space is a different cost. So depending on which you chose to change could change that. Yeah. And there would be some potential operational savings, but again, it would not be, you know, 20%, 20%. Okay. Okay, because so, so there are cer certain costs like uh, infrastructure for plumbing and electrical and things like that that are going to be essentially the same whether you build a bigger building or a smaller building. Is that is that is that accurate? Or? Yeah, I mean everything probably would scale, but essentially you're right. There there'd be those those items that would be pretty close to the same. Okay, because uh, when when we did discuss this and in, in, we didn't come down to specific numbers in, in uh, comparing the two projects, but um, that was my understanding of it is is the the, uh, the that we didn't get as much economy by trying to reduce the size of the building is is we would think we'd be, we'd be getting in we'd be sacrificing a lot in terms of future uh, utility of the building right you would not get everything you might be asking for you might not save as much money and then if down the road you went to expand or to add back what you left out it's going to be much more costly mm -hmm. not that phasing is not not a good idea but it would cost more to phase a facility like this in three phases than to build it all at once from a construction standpoint. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Thank you. That's my only question. Director Magner, you have me? Uh, I was on the liaison committee, and I don't have any questions right now. Thank you. I first saw this study a few days ago when I received it by via email, and uh, I have to admit it, I... I thought about when my mother used to say, uh, watch what you ask for because you may get it. Um, the, the, the numbers uh, in the study were so beyond what I was expecting that it, it took me a day or two to, to, to digest it. That yes, in fact, those were the numbers. Um, the, originally, this project started out to be Let's redo the senior, senior center because that's what w needed to be done. And everybody in the community knew it. And, um, and I was all for it. And if you go back and look at my campaign literature for the last two times I ran, I said it. It was always a gymnasium in the senior center. And I, I may be totally wrong and off base here, but the chances of funding a $30 million or a $50 million project is pie in the sky. So I think what we really need to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is to get back what we originally planned, and that was a senior center and a gymnasium, because those are the two things that this community needs the most. I know we need a lot of other things. There's no doubt about that, and I don't want to offend anybody that wants things that we probably cannot pay for. These were the two original items uh, that had the groundswell of support, and I, I, I don't see it happening in uh, any other way. Um, 
Uh, and uh, I have a technical question or a basic question. What is the so interior size in footage of the gymnasium? And I'm talking about uh, li length and width. Uh, well, a gymnasium, the actual basketball court or no. what you play on? I know what's, yeah, what size are you using for the basketball courts? A typical high school varsity court going side by side. No, no, uh, the single. You said you could play one game. It was going to be well, pa painted for where you could play one high school si style game. There would be two cross courts and one main court. The main court would be your typical high school varsity court. Your two cross courts were proposed to be a smaller recreational or intramural type court. Well, that's what I'm getting at. What size did you, in fact, use? For the high school court? I yeah. Believe, I believe uh, a high school court is 50 wide and I believe it's, it's, I think it's 94 foot long, but we used whatever that standard was. I just don't. Well, I, I just wanted to know what you use because a high school is 84 feet long and a, and a, col and a college uh, uh, court is 94 feet long. They're and both We would have used the high school 84 feet. Okay. Uh, but you, you do not have the interior dimensions for the gymnasium? The approximate space Square footage of the gymnasium. I have that, but I want to know what, what, were the, how, what was the length and the width of the building? The length and the width of the building. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, again, we're, trying, we're not trying to be vague, but we're, we didn't allocate uh, room sizes, if you will. We just allocated square foot for each of the various spaces. So we didn't, haven't come up with the, length, with the actual dimension for any of the spaces. Okay, that, that's, I mean, if at some point we can get those measurements that are being used, I'm, I'm very much interested uh, in those uh, measurements for the reasons I mentioned when I first started talking. Uh, and by the way, I'm putting my hat in for the project champion. <laughs> for only the gymnasium and the senior center. <laughs> okay, um, you know, I share the rest of the board's... Uh, uh, S just stunned when I read this. I mean, I've been re reading these reports for 12 years. I've never been so stunned to read what I read here. Um, because my recollection is when we started this process, you looked at our existing buildings and said that we had good bones and that those buildings were fine. So um, the proposal to basically replace our whole facility is, was a big surprise to me. So... Um, but we'll talk about that in comments. I, I, I'm going to limit. I'm going to limit my comments to, to questions, and that is on the slide where you uh, estimated the operating uh, costs and revenue. Were those numbers uh, for the uh, staffing projections? Is that in addition to the existing staff we have, or is that a total for all staff for it was, all this space? It would be the staff that does not exist. It's what this new facility would cost. Add to would so add to okay. It's, it's additional staff, it's you know additional contr con contractual services, it's also additional revenue, additional rental revenue, and additional recreation program revenue. So it's all what this facility would bring you and cost you. Okay. Um, and that's uh, when everything was completed, essentially. Okay. Yes, that would be with the plan three theory. Okay. So the um, additional net cost to us is $241,000 a year. Yes. Okay. That, that seems pretty optimistic to me. But um, You want to mention our current cost? <laughs> why, why don't you, Mike? Our current cost is for the people in the public. We're currently, for that 4,000 square foot senior center and some of the other rooms and stuff, our current labor cost is running $300,000 a year to run our senior programs is what we're paying today. Okay. Um, so next we're going to have... I have one comment. more question. Oh, you have one more comment? Yeah. Question. No, it's a question. Um, you went back there on the... Uh, and you don't need to go back to the slide, but um, Council Member Tremblay was asking about... Uh, Step two being the crux of the matter, so to speak, where everything would be uh, more refined 
and the costs would be more refined. How much would it cost us to get to the end of step two additional? We list, do we listed that in the report? I mean, as I understand it, the costs that we've paid for the study so far, the 87000 or what got us to here, and then we need to, it would cost more for the rest of this. Is that correct? Or maybe I'm wrong. Yes, there's additional costs to, to do those different steps. So about how much would it cost to get to where it's refined to find out what the real cost and the real size would be for what you're calling all of the people want, but which is really just what about 2,000 people responded out of 77,000. Yes, approximately 2,000 people responded out of 77,000. Um, and how much would it cost to get to the end of step two? I'll have to get back to give you an accurate number. I don't have that in front of me. You don't have a ballpark? I definitely don't want to make a okay. comment on the ballpark and be wrong. Okay, thank you. Okay, next is public oh. comment. Okay, so we will ask for public comments, and we're asking for public comments on the uh, study tonight. We only have two, and this is a prop from Matt. <laughs> I have two. Um, <laughs> I can just see what's coming here. There's no whipped cream in there. <laughs> no, there's no whipped cream in here. Excuse no. me. Yet. And there are only five of them. We need ten of them, Matt. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, first card is from Matthew Lorimer. And these are his props, I was told. Well, these are not props. You can oh. pass one to each of your city council members. Um, I, I keep them. So, this was very interesting. Um, so, in 2012, let me back up. I've lived in the community 23 years. I don't live here. Uh, I ran for city council, and I talked to seniors. Uh, they didn't have enough uh, food because of medicine, different things. We started a food program that's still in existence. And then we talked about the senior center. This looks like the hometown buffet. It looks like everything in the thing. Bob Kelly's got it right. This is not what I envisioned. The senior center currently, if you were there two weeks ago, I went in there, there's water coming in through the ceiling as people in there. It, it's, the beams are rotted. It's got asbestos. It's coming down, period. I'm proposing is the L, and I don't mean because of Lorimer, but it should go like this and go straight down. My proposal was the senior center where they're playing bingo. That is what I'm talking about. I did not talk about, like, I mean, this study is pretty broad based. I, if I won the lottery, I'd love to do a lot of things in life, but I can't, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pound on the city council. I am going to say for you know, for 30 years, every city's given a quarter of a million dollars. They have not stepped forward. I, I have my critics on that, but I'm talking about replacing the senior center, an L building, okay? That's what I want to know the cost is. I want to know the cost of that replacing that. Back then, I had a gentleman go over there, and he said between three to maybe five million dollars, depending on what you do. That's what I'm interested in, the people there. If you go there and you visit that building, um, the reason why it needs to be replaced, I can tell you, I did my own study, and the thing is, if you have a walker and you go in the bathroom, two people can't get by, one person can't buy, it's tough for seniors to get in that bathroom. The lighting is poor, the, the beams are rotted, it's got asbestos in the building, it leaks, go in that building, it needs to be torn down, period. Um, you know, I, I am in favor of a senior center, and the pie here, the, the dish here is to represent the city. You know, everybody deserves a piece of the pie. And what I mean by that, we got a great soccer field, a great library. You know, you're public servants. The city council should move forward and help build a senior center. But let's use some common sense here. I, I like studies, but this is a little over the top for me even. Okay, <laughs> 35 million is not what I requested. I gotta be honest with you. We need an L building. And that would replace the current building and suffice, I believe, but again, you've got others' opinion. That's what I'm talking about. The additional things we need in the future, I'm sure we need them, but the idea is I don't know how you're going to float $35, $50 million. I mean, it's just not what I envision in people. So I, I think this needs to go back. I know we hired these people, but I think 
the city should have a person, the park district, maybe do some sketching on paper and save some money for the citizens and let's move forward with that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Matt. And as always, you do stay within the time limit. Uh, I, f I neglected to say that each person does have three minutes. Next speaker is Bob Aaron. Yes, thank you. There's just, <clears throat> excuse me, so much brought up today. Uh, I'm frankly speechless uh, uh, other than to say that uh, it's, we have to look at alternatives for the senior center if we're looking specifically for seniors as opposed to looking at parks and recreation and, and all of that. And if, if we're narrowing this down to the senior center, then I, I don't know about this L-shaped um, concept that, that uh, Matt likes to pitch. But I do know that for a reasonable amount, amount, a workable amount of, let's say in the neighborhood of $5 million, uh, we can do something that won't stand the test of time, but uh, it'll stand the test of the time of the people who are living now and probably into their uh, uh, children's senior years. And I, I, I don't think that uh, we've been uh, quite, we've been too credulous here in the sense that uh, I, I would disagree with the source of uh, these, um, uh, I, I'm thinking about the, the, excuse me, the concept of junk in, junk out. Uh, 70,000 people and we have 300 or something like that. And then when you get down into the breakdowns of uh, age and sex and uh, this and that, it gets down to you know, four or five people uh, put on a chart that says that that represents X number of, of uh, good ideas. I, I just, the whole idea, the whole concept of how we approach this is, uh, is, is uh, I, I just don't support it at all. Uh, it's one of those things again that um, you know we have to go and seek out the experts because the local people are too uh, too dumb or something to uh, get together and and then talk this thing out. I've lived here thirty years. Look at you guys here. You know between us we have hundreds of years of <laughs> of life in this town and this that we need to. Uh, uh, go to somebody in, uh, and not to knock these guys, but in Colorado to uh, tell us what we need is ludicrous. So if you want to do it over again, uh, let's get a, a group together from who's here tonight or anybody else that wants to be a part of it and, and hash it out. And I think we can do something in six months. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. That's all the cards I have. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? The blue cards are back there. Uh, just fill one out and hand it to the city clerk and you'll be called in turn. Jay Evans. Good evening, council members, board members. Uh, I want to thank you all for moving forward on this project. And I, too, have sticker shock, Tony. <laughs> um, and what I want, not only congratulate you for working together and, and now giving us a foundation in which to move forward, and there's a lot of work yet to be done, obviously, <laughs> to come up with a project that's, that's uh, potentially more affordable and fundable. Um, and so I urge uh, the two bodies to continue to work together 
and, and take this report. Um, we got what, <laughs> what the RFP said. They delivered the, what we asked them to do, and now we need to take that information and, and, and work with it uh, to see if there isn't a way to meet, uh, if not all of those needs, some of the needs, or prioritize the needs and phase the project. Or, uh, But what I really want to urge is that we continue to work on this and, and keep going forward. Don't let the sticker shock stop us. Thank you. Thank you. Next card is from Christine Teller. Good evening. I'm also thankful that uh, what well, sticker shock was beyond all of our imagination. Um, and the senior center is really going to get so little of the square footage addition to this. They're talking about 68,000 square feet, and the, the senior center would get uh, like maybe five to 6,000 of it. Even the gym, that's 12,800. Is that, that's not going to be used by the seniors. No. I don't see them using the, the gym, so that's nothing to do with the senior center at all. So where we'd all like to see the senior center approved, this, this is just way beyond anything, any of our imagination. So as long as you're continuing, I, I, I feel like you're all leaning in that direction anyway. So I just needed my support for you. Thank you. Okay. I saw some more people going to, would you like, you don't need to fill out a card. You, yeah. Okay. Okay, very good. We're, we're still taking them. Come on. Okay. Um, I've been moved to Camarillo in the 60s, so I know a lot of you up here very yep. well. Um, <laughs> Your name for the record, please. John Spawn. I will say that the gym is used extensively by a lot of the seniors, um, from table tennis to badminton to basketball. And it was oh, built back... Uh, and pickleball, that's right, because you guys are out there. Um, it's used every single day mm -hmm. into the nighttime. And uh, there's no water fountains. It was built back for the Air Force Base back in the 50s. It belongs to the Oxnard High School District, which they lend to Parks and Rec, which is great. The parking lot is owned by the airport, mm -hmm. so it's a really configured differently. There's no water fountains out there. So it's no air conditioning, and something like that really needs to be looked at going forward. So thank you all. Good. Mike? Good question. Uh, John, it's been a long time since I got and played at that basketball court. You know how it is. I know. We both graduated almost the same time. We got close. But uh, th there's no, there used to be water out there in that gym. Did they just let no it go? No water fountains whatsoever. Oh, they let there's it go. There's bathrooms where you can wash your hands. Yeah. Hmm. You know, and there's a... Uh, Everything else is pretty much locked up behind the doors there. Sure. So it's very antiquated. Now that you've spoken, you can still give your card to the city clerk. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> now that you've spoken, after the fact, you can give your card to the city clerk. Oh, okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Come on. Come on down. The job's not over till the paperwork's done. There you go. <laughs> Mary Jane Paxton, and I live at 30 Margarita. Can you pull the microphone a little closer? Okay. I live at 30 Margarita in Camarillo. I use the Senior Center quite frequently and enjoy all the amenities there. I did have a question of the whole group. About a year ago, you had a proposal in front of you. It didn't really go to Parks and Rec yet. They wanted to develop a piece of land that you had uh, part of, Mr. Kildee, out on uh, Pleasant Valley and Las Posas? I, I have to say something. I can't be part of this discussion because I rent from the applicant. So okay. I but I wonder whatever happened with that. that they, was wanted, they wanted to build a... That application was uh, rejected by the city council. So it, it will not come before you again? No. Uh, 
Unfortunately, no. Uh, no, not that particular proposal. Uh, it is quite possible that the developer who was involved in that project may come back with an alternative proposal and possibly on a different site. Okay, because it, it included a convention center, as I remember, and also a large um, gym project for children. It, it was a request. It was a request for a general plan referral, and it was voted down to, re to refer it for further study. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's what I was asking about. I, th I thought maybe it would be a somewhat alternative in conjunction with what we're talking about here, that some of this expense would be onto them and not onto the citizens of Camarillo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Please. This is your chance, folks. State your name for the record, please. My name is Jennifer McNulty, and I live over on Mobile. I'm a new resident of Camarillo. Um, I've only lived here about six months. And um, the prior 20 years, I've lived in Thousand Oaks. Um, I have a 21-year-old -year son with special needs, and I was requested by Cecilia Laufenberg, who is head of um, the Therapeutic Parks and Recreation uh, in Thousand Oaks, to attend this meeting and see if there's any needs discussed in terms of um, therapeutic programming. I'm sorry I didn't have in, uh, input into the survey, um, so I can only come here with you know, an open mind and just, you know, knowing that the city is wanting to expand programming is a great thing. No In Thousand right. Oaks, we had a wonderful park system and many, many programs, and we still go up the hill for programs. So I'm looking for programs for myself and my son. And the one thing I can say is coming here to find out that the site on Carmen is being discussed for potentially a $50 million upgrade. I'm just really surprised that I'm wondering if other sites were considered. I see a lack of, like, na there's such Camarillo is such a big area, and I don't see much being considered where there's nature, where there's outdoor space in addition to putting. Like, what about the site that's the Kildee site where the pool is? I mean, I'm wondering if that other site was considered because there seems to be so much more space there. And um, I just wonder about considering other sites for a big improvement like that. Okay, we can't answer that, but the consultant could answer whether they considered other sites, I think. Okay. Is that something I can ask now? Uh, we'll ask him when, when you're finished, but continue your comments. Okay, so that's... Just what I was, you know, I, my perspective is, gosh, there's that, the fields and there's the um, community center building, which seems like to increase it by three. I just wonder if the neighborhood residents, it, that is really, that footprint will use up most of the land. There's not going to be a lot of space left. And it, I just, it seems to be such a small site to choose for that. So, um, you know, I just wanted to give my perspective okay. that I'd, I'd love to see a larger site chosen. And, um, you know, I'd love to have input into, you know, I don't see any much in the way of special needs programming in Camarillo. So okay. we'll be c continuing to go up the hill until more of that's developed here. Thank you. Right, thank you. We will, if there are any questions that come up will have responses at the end of all the public comment, which is the city council's current uh, practice. Is there anyone else who would like to make comments, please? Hello. Um, my name is Stephanie Modard, and I've been a resident here for about 10 years now, mm -hmm. and I own a business here in town. And um, I, I hear that there needs to be a senior center at Parade, and I just want to say that um, I am grateful that you've taken the time to do this assessment to see what the really what the community needs and that I encourage you to move forward so that we can have an amazing community center where all generations can come together and and everybody in the community's needs can be met whatever that looks like and um, you know money can be found somewhere to make this happen and um, and it's important to know that 
um, we're not looking at just one space. We're looking at a space where everybody can use everything. In and So it brings generations together and it brings um, better use of space. And um, I just encourage everybody in the community to have an open mind about it. Um, and including the city council, um, you know, the old building doesn't work anymore because it's falling apart. And, and um, I've been to a lot of the, the needs assessments and I participated in the survey and um, I just, I, I don't want to, I, I want to see the needs of the entire community met, not just one certain area of the population. Um, because as um, they pointed out, we're going to grow by 10,000 in the next couple of years. So um, it's better to spend the money now so that we can provide for all of our future um, citizens of Camarillo. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't do a very good job of explaining so at the very beginning. So for anybody who doesn't understand the government structure here in Camarillo, we are two completely separate bodies. Uh, they have uh, governance over their district, which is the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District. We have governance over the city of Camarillo, which is completely as strange as it might seem, unrelated to the Recreation and Park District. So they own the buildings, they own the parks, except for Constitution Park next door and uh, Dizdar Park. And we are talking about how is it we can cooperate together with two government agencies to fulfill the needs of uh, segments of the population or the entire population or something. Uh, we are not going to, we're going to have comments from all of us later, but we're not going to be deliberating and hammering all this out tonight. I think we'd be here for probably four or five days on end if we did that. Each of our government agencies, governing bodies needs to have our own discussions and they will be public discussions uh, and we'll figure out how much of what we want to participate in and where we want to go, and then we'll probably meet together at some point and decide how we can put all of our druthers together. Uh, if it's all still in our lifetimes. <laughs> so at any rate, is there anybody else? Yes, sir, come on up. The reason we ask you to come to the microphone is so all of us can hear what each one of you says and so anybody out in television land can hear what you say. Uh, Marty Lentz from Rosewood Avenue. Okay. Um, I just think don't lose focus. We came here for a new, from the beginning, a couple years for a new <coughs> center. That's right. You know, and that's what you really should really concentrate on. Everything else is just gravy, you know, and, and you, we came a long ways. Don't give up, you know, just work it out somehow and, uh, we need a new senior center, and that's, you know, basically, we should get one. That's, that's right. all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> My name is Renee Sherry. I live up on Glenbrook. We've lived here 28 years. Mm -hmm. um, I was very excited about this company doing this study. I thought, oh, this is perfect. As I recall, we were supposed to get three plans. It doesn't seem we actually got a plan. Um, it's my only comment on that. I would like to see a, a kind of separate senior center. I agree we should all come together, but the seniors need a place where they can gather as seniors. Uh, I've visited the Thousand Oaks, the Simi Valley, even Ventura has much better facilities and programs and atmosphere than we do. And it's really sad because we have a high percentage of seniors. I teach a class there. I volunteer they teach a class there. Um, and we're running out of space. We mm -hmm. have no supplies, no... It's an art class, we have no easels, we have no space to put an easel, we have tables that collapse. 
So I hate to hear that, oh, we'll get this $50 million building, and then we'll still have to share everything. We won't have what seniors need. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? <coughs> Seeing no one come forward, we will go on to the next part of the uh, meeting. I'll turn it over to Mr. Malloy. Yeah, we're going to have com comments uh, from the council and the board, but first we're going to have a little 10-minute break. This we've been at it here for an hour and a half, so we're we're adjourned for 10 minutes. If you, can you help me with the question? I believe the question was about, yes. Um, we looked at multiple locations. We looked at where uh, the aquatic center is. We looked at all the different locations. A location hasn't been fully <coughs> decided upon at this time. The current location, because you own all that property and because the proposed elements would all fit, is what was being recommended to be considered. Um, we did look over where the aquatic center was. Um, right Kildee there. Park, as she called it. Pardon me? Kildee Park Kildee is the Park. lady car. Yes, it. and I believe that's where the Boys and Girls Club might be right next to it. Yes. Yes. And there's lots of athletic fields there as well, so there's not as much unused space there as you might think. That's right. Okay. I think... We also had a question from uh, Jennifer McNulty regarding uh, um, special needs. And was special needs a part of the surveys, questions? We did hear that there was interest in special needs and the different elements that were proposed would be able to handle special needs. Special needs could occur in a gymnasium. Special needs activities could, could occur in the group exercise rooms. They could occur in the classrooms. So they weren't excluded, but again, we were looking at a higher level. We didn't get down to specifically whether it was basketball or volleyball or, you know, an exact activity. But special needs, if that facility was designed with those spaces, special needs would definitely be able to be accommodated. Okay. Thank you. That, that's all the questions okay. that I... That thank are. you. Th thank you, Tom. Okay. Now we'll go to... Council members, comments. comments. Any volunteers? <laughs> Any volunteers, Tony? Well, you want me to walk out on my limb first? Go ahead. Okay. Sure. So you can take your tree saws and cut it off behind. Cut them off. Cut off the limbs behind me. Um, first of all, uh, in in my opinion. This has been a very useful exercise. I, I want to say thank you to the consultants because I know that they worked very hard uh, at this. And the consultants um, did, and I was a member of the liaison committee, and the consultants did what uh, we asked them to do. And you have a plan three <laughs> cost estimate that is uh, somewhat beyond robust. I'd put it in the breathtaking category, and that's no critique. It's just it is what it is. Um, and the difference between the criteria for Plan 2 versus Plan 3 is also, uh, th there's a very large differential. Um, I'm also, but, but it's given us, if you think of it this way, it, it, if you think of it in the way, maybe I could analogize it to a, a harbor or going out to sea, it's given us, in my view, kind of the outer buoy view of what is possible. I also am really pleased that we have both the Board of Directors of PVRPD and the City Council up here sitting together, having cooperated through this um, study and meeting now, uh, and I think that's uh, outstanding, and I am really pleased that, that we're doing that. Um, 
I, I guess, I, I don't know if I've ever heard that, uh, you know, nothing sharpens the mind like sharpening the pencil. Uh, but um, there's a difference between what's needed always, be, between what's needed and what one can reasonably afford. And that's why all of us have monthly budgets and weekly budgets and monthly budgets and, and annual O&M budgets too, which I saw up on the screen. Um, I think, first of all, there are so many different identified needs. I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we have, and forgive me, I'm going to ramble just for a second. We have this universe of needs, and we're trying to truncate them somewhat, and, and we have a, a lot of needs in the community. And the question is, from a fulfillment standpoint, who is equipped to fill those needs? And we have jurisdictional issues that we got to work through and so on. But it's also fair to say that the city and the Recreation and Park District in large part serve the same residents, serve the same taxpayers, serve the same fee payers. And so we serve the same populations in, very, in large part, not quite. Not quite symmetrical, but, but, but close. Um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we have a lot of needs besides the senior center. The needs that were up on the, on the board uh, in terms of what is identified, particularly with respect to, in my view, programmatic and meeting space needs and the auditorium needs uh, are significant. They are significant. And then the question becomes, how do, you don't want to put those aside and put them on a shelf somewhere and forget about them because I think there, there are, I think those are very significant. I'm leaving aside the senior center for a second. I'm going to come back to it. Those are very significant needs. And I think we're going to have to pay it. Everyone in the community has to pay attention to that because we want this to be a, a thriving community, all of us. And what's best, that's why all of us here tonight in this room want what's best for this community. We might approach it in a different manner, but we all want what's best for the community. Um, but I also know that from a feasibility standpoint, we have to focus on what is the art of the possible and what's feasible. And sometimes um, you have to focus on, on what is feasible in a, uh, in a reasonable period of time. And I, forgive me for coining the phrase sticker shock. That wasn't meant in a disrespectful way. It just, it just is. And it's a huge amount of money. So uh, what Director Kelly said uh, earlier um, uh, resonates with me. Um, and I think what I'm inclined, and I'm the first one to walk out on the limb, folks. So you know you can criticize, what, how, go for it. I'm inclined to focus more on what got us into this process in the first place, which is, and, and I had always felt during my campaign that the, the highest priority need was for a senior center, was for a revamped, I'll just call it revamped, senior center, however you, however you define that, with an expanded. And so I think what we, should do is look at this incrementally. And I think, but I think the first focus ought to be on how we put together a revamped, how we support one another in putting together a revamped and expanded senior center together with sufficient space for programmatic needs uh, for those seniors. Uh, and I think that's what I would respectfully suggest we be as sort of a, a, a first focus in the incremental part of that. And, and in a lot of this from a, like the gymnasium standpoint is a traditionally a recreation and park district need, but it is also a community need. I get that part. But I think my focus would be without forgetting all the other needs, which are important, I think we ought to focus on the senior center and how we make that how we make that happen and approach the process with three variables in mind. The first being what are the design and components of that through the 
process that was outlined up here in terms of the design components, schematic design process with a focus on capital improvements and O&M. The second annual O&M cost, the second are what are our financing options and what can the community afford? And, and thirdly, between us up here, what are the roles that our two entities are going to play in that? And we have to have some more specific discussion on that part. So I've now crawled out of my limb, and you can take your tree saws and cut it off behind me. But I think that's where we should start. We should start focusing our efforts. Bring it back. Bring it back to a senior center focus and then go from there. And it could be that part of this is by, by doing that, we also are able to accommodate some of the needs for additional meeting space and, and, needs to have, and our needs for a more robust senior uh, program scenario. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Morgan. How do I uh, re recopy what he just said? <laughs> because all I knew about when we took when they sent this forward to meet with Park and Rec, which I thought was a great idea, I remember building that building, and it only took months. And it was done, but then it became the senior center, which is a good replacement for what didn't work out. Um, the idea, though, when we per first forwarded that, was to make room for expansion in the future. If that building is, if, if they needed more room. Uh, and so I think we're looking at the same thing now. We're ready to do that expansion. A lot of things could be cleaned up, of course, and made better in that present building. Uh, I don't know about the, the I, I go there occasionally. I don't see those things falling down. Uh, but going through and redoing, you know, making, bringing it up to date, adding more to it. I think that was the goal in the beginning. Also, some of these things that were brought up by Miss, uh, is she still, she's not here, that someone sent her from Thousand Oaks to talk to us about these other programs. Well, one of the things that we could do if we're expanding and having other classrooms kind of thing, some of those kind of programs could be had there because the seniors aren't always filling up everything. Right now it's, it's packed because, I mean, the card players, the, the every kind of player, uh, the computer, computer guys, everything, it's full. And so they, they do have a lot of uh, need for room. Um, but by expanding it, I, I'd say almost double then you have something that also accommodate other usages, and it wouldn't cost us $55 million, excuse me, 50, I can't even say that word. I was shocked when I came in and knew, heard the program being produced, being uh, introduced this evening, because I didn't think we were gonna go that far. That's, that's a lot of, that's almost double our desal plant we're looking at. And so um, I think w by moving forward and going toward uh, what we, I thought we were going, is to have this, have this expanded, improved, and made it usable to others also, but not to the extent that we were, were given a report this evening. That's it. You can go. Yeah. Work our way down the road. <laughs> well, I um, was part of the liaison committee, and I will tell you that I felt it would be very short-sighted to go out and do a study if you didn't look at the whole. And I believe we have heard from our public, um, from our community, um, and received what is statistically valid survey. Um, it's amazing when you have 77,000 people and you only get the surveys back, but that, that is a survey. Unfortunately, people don't respond. But every person in this community was given the opportunity for, to through very many venues and, and opportunities to, to participate. They got to tell us what they need. And this community is made up of more than just seniors. It's made up of more than just our, our very smallest. We're a community that, that is, is a mix of all ages. And it's um, important for all of us to meet all the needs of the community. So to me, it was very, very important that we step back and we looked at the big picture. We now know what the, um, what it would look like if we could have everything everybody wanted. And so to, um, we talked a lot about what they brought to us. They brought to us that top notch, everything you wanted um, project and dollar wise. So now our job is to begin to scale it back and pick, okay, what can we afford? What does it look like? And how do we meet the needs of most people 
with what we can afford. And I don't know that we know sitting here right now exactly what we can afford because I don't think we've researched how we're going to pay for this. I think that's one of the steps that has to come into play very shortly. I go back to when we built the library. One of the reasons that we were able to build the library the way we we did is because we had a grant. We knew we had money in, the, in our pocket to start with, and that allowed us to build something for our community that is amazing 10 years later, and it's really one of the focuses of this community. To me, our community deserves the exact same thing from the Recreation and Park District. That's what our community deserves. And I believe our seniors deserve more than remodeling that building that is literally falling apart. They deserve the best. So what we have to do is figure out how to do it. Obviously, we can't build this whole big thing and have it done in 18 months or even four years. It's just not a possibility. But I don't want us to lose sight of what the fact that we have a whole community and we should try to meet as many needs as we can. I think we need to step back, spend a little time trying to figure out exactly what we could raise, how much money we'd have to spend, spend a little more time refining it, and uh, my suggestion would be, while it may cost a little in the end, is to look at phases. So maybe that first phase is indeed the senior center, but at the same time, we've planned for what comes next. So that by the time we're done, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 15 years from now, you have got a complex there that is the state of the art, something that this community can be proud of and that everyone can use. We heard a lot about in the surveys social space, and it wasn't just um, just for the seniors, that people wanted to come together to be together as a community. So I don't want us to be short-sighted and say, well, it's just for this group, it's just for that group. We, we should be there together. Designated space for particular projects, for particular types of um, classes, et cetera and giving seniors their own space for, for that, but it should be more than that. They should be able to go out. They should be able to have a gymnasium where they can go out and play their pickleball. If you ask me what I would ask for in the phase um, one would be to build a senior center and a gymnasium. We've now given something to our seniors. <clears throat> We've now given something that our youth and our, our young adults need, and the seniors use that gymnasium as well. We've now given two pieces of that big, beautiful building to our community, but we've also started something. But I think to, rather than tonight to sit up here and say, this is what we should do and we're going to decide that, to vote on it, we need to say, take this survey, take the information we have, now let's step back a little bit and let's decide what's really good for the community and decide what we can afford. Because I believe we need we deserve more in this community than just a building with some walls and rotted beams and just because we go out a little further and make it a little bit bigger. Our community deserves more and we need, we as elected officials ought to be able to figure out how to do it. And it isn't what I promised in a campaign because I was talking to this group or what I promised to that group. I don't do that. I look at the community as a whole and each and every group is just as important as another. But you got to start somewhere and I think starting with the seniors in the gymnasium is something that we realistically could do, but I definitely want us to plan for the whole in the future. Thank you. Mr. Kildee. I'll try to keep my comments relatively brief. I think, you know, when you do a study like this, I think it's very, very important that we get as much data as we can because we don't do these studies very often here. And there's a, a wealth of really, really good data here, I think, that can really be used uh, beneficially here. Um, a couple of things, I think some of the good things is, is apparently, we, with any luck, we might be able to put something on the Burnley site. And I didn't really think of that. I'm not part of the liaison committee, and I've had discussions thinking about where this senior center gymnasium can be. And so that's a good thing if, in fact, it'll work on a site because we don't have to pay for the dirt. And that is really, really important. I think it's also important to realize that four or five million dollars isn't going to get you a lot in today's uh, environment. Um, my understanding and the city managers here that anything that we build here will probably trigger prevailing wage. Is that right? 
Will that? Yes, it's a fully public project okay. and it is subject to prevailing wage. Now, prevailing wage would probably add probably up to 20, 25% more than if any of us were to go out there privately and try to do this. So you've got that escalator effect on this. Uh, uh, you know, we've had uh, a lot of uh, experience in building, and what we thought would be three to four million can easily get up to you know ten to fifteen million, really easy right now. So I think what we do tonight, and this is just a suggestion that I'm making, is that we take this data and we start a game plan now. Let's get a game plan together here about what the priorities are. And if the priorities are a senior citizen center and a gymnasium, that we start to really focus on how we can get that accomplished. Secondly, and I know it's difficult for all of us to do, but maybe the Elias on committee can start this discussion is get some sort of budget here. It's very difficult for me to plan something without some kind of a budget. I'm a business guy. I have to have a budget because that's going to be a lot of the contingents on what realistically, and I mean realistically, that we can build there if we have some sort of a budget here uh, that we're working on. Um, again, I think we're on the right direction. I really believe that we can get something done. And I have to say, too, that both organizations have had a long history of working together on this, a uh, very long history, and I know that if we put, there's some really sharp people in the audience and up here, I know if we put our heads together, we get a realistic uh, idea of what we can do. And remember, it kind of talked about what the future is. We got senior citizens now, well, 10 years from now, we're gonna have more. So we have to take that into consideration on what we're building here because you know, I believe that bond for the current Burnley, I think it was done in about 1968. So we want to make sure that we can get at least 15, hopefully 20, 25 years out of whatever we do. So with that thinking, we're going to have to think out of the box here and really look to the future. And obviously it's very important for the present here, but we have to look out for the future of the future generations that will have the benefit of this. So those are my two ideas here. Uh, I just ask everybody to, you know, keep working on this. And I really believe that, that uh, something's going to happen here. Thank you. Mrs. Craven. Um, well, I haven't ever served on the Recreation and Park District Board, and I wasn't on the, rec on the liaison committee, so maybe I'm looking at this a little differently. But when this first came to us, us being the city council, we were asked if we would like to participate in a study about a uh, senior center. And that's what I voted on. At a subsequent meeting, uh, representatives of the, Le or a representative of the liaison committee, because at that time the other one couldn't serve on it <laughs> uh, because of a conflict of interest. Uh, we were asked if we would look at all of the needs as the district, district wide of everybody of all ages. And the council agreed to that. And we agreed, what we were agreeing to was not to what they do, but to pay for half of the study to do that. And there was quite a big difference. Um, I, at the time I expressed I was still interested in the senior center part of this. Looking at it parochially, I still feel that the senior center is what I'm interested in. Everybody can talk about having to fill all the needs of all the community. When we were looking at land for a sports park, or as we called it then, soccer fields, I didn't hear anybody talking about needs of the seniors. And so there might be a few seniors running around out there, but I think the majority of the people out there are young people. And so I think, in my mind, at that time and at other times, we've looked at fulfilling the needs of younger people, and now we need to settle down to looking at the needs of seniors. I don't believe necessarily 
just uh, putting a new roof on that current building is going to do it. It's too small, perhaps doubling the size, perhaps. There are ways to remodel things, uh, re-roof them. They end up looking like a new structure. You can utilize the walls, the floors. Uh, it is possible to rewire and do all that, put in new sprinkler systems. And I think you could probably do it all for about five to seven, eight million dollars. If you had a really grand one. I, I just, uh, I'm still going back to the senior center. If, if there's a need for a gymnasium that was well, um, sure, there are some seniors who use the gymnasium, but what I got into this was for a senior center, not for a two-part. So maybe the two agencies need to figure out what each one is willing to do. Uh, we have to remember that in the end, any facility will belong to a different agency than the city. And even though we more and more are getting into parks, uh, I, I believe that any of these facilities that would be uh, constructed under this plan would be owned by and operated by the Recreation and Park District. So I rambled a little too long, but you got my point. Thank you. And, and thank all of you for your participation. Uh, Mike. <laughs> I'm probably going to be tying Tony's time here on this. Um, let me just start by referencing what Charter Craven was talking about. Uh, for people who don't know, the senior center in the city of Thousand Oaks and in Simi Valley, those structures are physically owned by the city. The one in Thousand Oaks is built on park the Canal Wreck and Park District land, but the, the buildings are owned by the city. They actually pay the utility bills. It's their building. There's no transfer of funds anywhere. I was just saying what I foresaw. No. Excuse okay. me. No, I'm just, I'm just, I just want to give background you know, information here for the audience. So the agreement that they have up in Thousand Oaks and in, in Simi Valley, so the city owns that particular senior center, which they're each about 22,000 square feet. And um, they pay the utility cost, the janitorial cost, because it's their physical building. If something breaks, they have to fix it. But then the Rec and Park does all the maintenance, parking, and they do all the staffing. And if you look over a 10, 20 year period, the costs come out about the same because the staffing costs will add up over time and essentially add up to what the basic cost is. That, that's giving, I'm just providing some background on that. Now, I'm gonna thank the city council. I, I, I'm basically in agreement with most of what the city council was saying in terms of the focus of the study. Um, but I'm going to come at it a slightly different way, and I'm going to go back to the what's called a request for proposal. For those in the audience who don't know what that is, it's often referred to as an RFP, and it's um, it lists what the contractor is supposed to do, or the consultant in this case is supposed to do, and it has all the list of all the tasks and all the deliverables. And for people in the audience who may be interested, you can go to the Pleasant Valley Rec and Park site and you can download this off of our, if you go to our agenda, look at the June 7th, 2017 agenda packet, you will find this there and you can download it and you can see what the, what the particular deliverables are and stuff. And the reason I'm bringing that up for this draft study, if you compare it against what the the deliverables are, doesn't add up. We're missing various sections. So this, the, 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 the actual list of deliverables says X, Y, Z, for example. And basically the draft report only provides like an X. So there's a Y and a Z missing, but we, this is not the final report. So I'm basically saying there's some items that we have to include in the final report that are missing as is described in the RFP that the board originally approved back in June of 2017. And by doing that, that will help us with these decisions that we're talking about. And I'm gonna go through here and point out a few examples of that. So I just wanna make, make that point first. Um, the first thing I found missing here in the draft report is that we're supposed to have a list of current, uh, current facilities and description of thereof and the various things. Well, that's not, we don't have any inventory of our current things. I mean, I had to ask, is that 21,800 feet even include the office space? I mean, that, we're supposed to have a page in here somewhere or an appendix or something that lists all our things. How big is our auditorium? I don't know. 
I, I know the senior center is 4,000 square feet, but I don't know what our sizes are for our existing meeting rooms and all that stuff. So that, and that was task number one that's listed in here. So we need to go back and, and include that information for us to have a starting point to go forward with. And that will help us with our thinking as the council members were talking about. The next thing that's missing from here is, is part of task number four, which describes what the uh, particular potential solutions are. And several of the people who came up here in the audience mentioned that too. And if you look at Item number, task number four on page five of this document, it says the consultants shall provide three tiers of a potential solutions, including a deluxe standard and economy uh, uh, solution based on the community input. And then if you look on page four, which has the project scope for this, it clearly points out that the plan is for expansion of existing facilities and or construction of new facilities. I'm bringing that up because on plan one from the consultants here, plan one was looking at repurposing or re, you know, making a makeover or workover, whatever aspect of the, of the existing facilities. Nowhere in this document will you find those words anywhere in here. I don't know why they put that in there. And then they go on to say, well, by, by doing a workover on the existing facilities, we're not adding space. I don't need to spend $100,000 for a consultant to tell me that if you just do a work over, you're not adding space. We already knew that before we, we even started the project. That's why we're looking for. So plan number one, they had the plan one and two and three. The plan three is the deluxe version models everybody talked about, but there is no plan one in here. And so I think based like on what I'm hearing and based on my own input, a plan one in here should be how much would it cost to go in there and put a senior center with a gym, for example, and you break all that stuff out and you just, you can talk about, you can have the difference between plan one and plan two being if you replace the existing senior center or whatever, but that will provide us some real information as a starting point. I don't need to know that the total, if we do everything in the world, it's gonna cost 52 million. I wanna know back here on step one, if we did a phasing or something, that's the first phase we're gonna start with anyway. So I'm just building on to what most of the council members have said. I do think a gym, Freedom Gym is falling apart it's going to fall apart and die pretty soon. And we do have seniors using it during the daytime. And then the youth can use it in the evening and stuff. So that would be part of the senior thumb. And by building a senior complex, that will free up the other meeting rooms we have for other users then potentially. Because right now the, the seniors are overfilling and flooding the whole complex. So that will help us. So what I think we need to do on the final report, when the final report is turned in, is to go back and add a plan one, which focuses in, in, on the senior center in a gym uh, out there at, at, the, at the site. And that would then help us a lot moving forward with that. Uh, I got some other stuff here. Let me go on to... The, the plan two as listed in here is almost worthless. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a little minor subset of plan three. So that doesn't really help us. So we need a real plan one and a real plan two. And the plan two can be something there in between maybe the seniors and adding a little bit more community space or something for a real plan two. So we need a, a new plan two and a brand new from scratch plan one. Um, that was the main focus on that part. And then on... And the R, R, uh, you know, on the request for a proposal, there's a task number five in here, and that again goes back to some of the questions and comments brought up. And that was put in there specifically for funding mechanisms. And there was a slide that presented tonight, the first time I saw that slide, but nowhere in the draft, nowhere in the draft document that we have, which is 200, 208 pages long or something, does it have any mention of task number five, which is funding mechanisms and having examples of what other communities and people are doing across California to address this. We need some, we need some examples that we can look at and, and explore as a follow-up as people were talking about, but we need to get started on that. That's why we put in task number five so that we can have some funding mechanisms to explore, but we don't have that at all. This, nowhere in the draft report besides saying that the public isn't interested in, in paying through a bond issue. Besides that, there's no mention of funding mechanisms, and that was listed under task item number five. So that would help us move forward. So in summary, I'm saying 
we got a lot of good stuff, but the, the work so far is only partially completed. And what we need to do is I'm recommending is to have the liaison committee go back and work with the consultants, pull out the RD, RDF that we have, RP, uh, the request for proposal, and go through there line by line by line because it has very clear tasks and very clear de deliverables. And if we implement all that stuff and fill in the gaps, we'll get a final report that would then give us the basis to move forward as people were talking about. But right now we just have this solve the world's problems issue out there and that's not gonna help us make anything move forward on. So that's my recommendation. I think we're, we're, we're getting closer, but we have those gaps to fill in. If we fill those gaps in, I think that would give us a good foundation to go to step number two. But we need those gaps to be filled in first before moving on. And that, that's my uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Dr. Hickson. Okay. Okay, it's a little hard to follow that, but uh, um, I would like to thank the consultants for, for the job that they did. They, they did, um, in large part, I think what we asked them to do. We asked them to go out, and the, for the last several years, the community has been coming to us and telling us that we need a new, a new uh, senior center. But as, as we looked at this, it really didn't make sense to, to isolate out just a certain segment of the population, under, undertake a major ex, uh, expenditure and expansion project without looking at, looking at what the needs of the entire community were. And so uh, that's, that's how, in my mind, this got expanded to be more of a community needs assessment rather than just a senior needs assessment. We wanna meet the, the needs of the, of the seniors because we have been woeful in our, in our services to the, to the seniors up to this point. Our community center is clearly inadequate and needs to be redone. But it, it doesn't make sense to me to if we're gonna take this opportunity to undertake a major expansion project to not look at the needs of how we can leverage this to provide for needs of the community we're gonna to have to deal with anyway rather than taking this as a separate entity just the seniors, and now when we're done with that, now now we have to deal with other with other issues. Uh, we are uh, all of us up here are are here representing the entire community. We we're not elected just to serve elite athletes or seniors or any specific group. We're here to to represent the entire community. That means you know middle middle aged people, young adults young children that can't vote, seniors, special needs people, we need to, we need to be looking at how do we serve that entire community. And it doesn't make, doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense for us to undergo, a pro to develop a project like this and is isolate it to only a, a specific group. I think that there's been, been in, at least in my vision of this, has been we are gonna build a building and the building is capable of serving the entire community. There's, there's people have gotten up and, and felt that the seniors are only getting a small portion of this. But really, the, the, as, as I see the, 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 the concept, again, there, there's, there's no building designed here. This is just a concept at this point. But the concept, the concept shows that there are areas of the, of the complex that are dedicated to seniors, areas that are dedicated to youth. But the bulk of, of it is general use. A classroom doesn't care whether it's a child or an adult, adult or a senior in there. The uh, exercise rooms are used by all. The gymnasium is going to be used by by seniors. We can see from this survey response that we that we've gotten that the seniors want active. Uh, Act, uh, programs. They want gymnasiums. They want to play pickleball. They want to play shuffleboard. They want to play badminton. All, all these are active sports that we have to have facilities for them to use. And those facilities are equally usable by, by the younger adults. And so um, I'm not in favor of, look, of narrowing the scope of the project to just a senior, a senior uh, project. I think this has to be a general use project. And, and the fact is that even if we taper this down to just a senior program, it's not gonna be inexpensive. You can't, if you go out and, and buy a 30 year old tract home in this house, in this town, it's gonna cost you three quarters of a million dollars. So that, you know, there's your sticker shock. So 
What what did we think we were going to get for four million dollars if you if a three if a three bedroom thirty year old house with with sh shake shingles cost three seven hundred fifty thousand dollars? So it's it's an expensive project, but I th I think we think big. You know this this is a, this is a, a fantastic community. All of us live here because this is a beautiful, fantastic place to live, and it's our job to make sure that we pass on a beautiful, fa fantastic place to live to generations that are coming to, fo to follow us. And I think that this is a project that will benefit the entire community. The, um, no, lost, lost my, my train of thought there for a, for a second, but the, um, no. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. But, but uh, I, think, I think that we do need to be looking at um, t taking this project with where it is now. No one is proposing at this point that we go out and spend $52 million or $55 million or any, or any millions of dollars to, to do anything. With the, this, the, we, we, the survey that we've received, in, the one criticism I might have is that the way it was designed was we went out and asked people, what, do you, what is it that you want? We didn't ask, what is it that you're willing to pay for? And so th when you ask people, what do you want? What do you want the government to give you? Th they'll ask for everything. And that's what we have. And it's, uh, I think the task that we have now is how do we narrow that down to what really ne meets the needs of the majority of our community, of all walks of life, and how do we keep it reasonably cost effective. But I don't think we need to think small. Um, the survey, the, oh, it's, 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 it's what I was trying to think of is the, the survey shows that the, the median income in this city is over $90,000, whereas this, the state of California average is $65,000. So we are, a very high income group of people in this in this town and i think that this is not a, this is not a, a project can we afford it it's really a more of a question of will we afford it i think we can i think that this is a, do, a doable project and maybe not 52 million dollars maybe it's 40 or maybe it's 35 but i but i think for a Real small, like oh, let's scrap the whole thing and go about, go out and just you know add a few hundred square feet onto the back of the existing senior center. I think is thinking very small, and I think is not. Uh, I think it's going to be mo uh, money that is not well spent, and I think it's not going to be serving future residents of this community. So, I'm probably in the minority here, but I believe that we should think big, and I think we should go out and look at what what it is we can do instead of focusing on what it is that we can't do. Thank you. Director Magner. Can I say ditto? <clears throat> um, I'm a firm believer in, I, I, know what's, I know what we went out for and I know what we got and I firmly believe that we need to deal with the situation of we know what the, the uh, platinum uh, level is, we know what the um, uh, wood v version is so we need to come into some place somewhere in between and we need to make that decision as a group and I think we can do that we've got the information and I think that that we that's a good starting point for us so uh, I'm fully in support of a multi-use uh, building or complex um, the seniors as we know are usually there during the day some of them are there during the evening the youth would be using it during the evening, and the gymnasium is a must. It just has to be. Um, we have no place for these kids to, to uh, be in the evening to do the drop-in basketball. Even I, my son played at Freedom, and that was 30 years ago, and it wasn't good then. It's definitely not good now. I know it's not. And I, I could, I'm very concerned about is it going to fall down tomorrow or is it going to fall down in three weeks? So uh, that's got to be taken care of. The senior center, we, we can't have the pool players and the card players in a 10-foot, in a 10, foot, a 10 by 10 room. It just doesn't work that way. And um, that doesn't mean that they're going to have a, a 
card room that's always going to be their card room. It may be used by somebody else in the evening or on the weekends. But we do need both of them. So um, I think the liaison committee has done a lot of work, and I want to thank Tom and his group. Um, they were very easy to work with. Um, Mary drove the, the uh, vehicle and uh, with the help of, of the city administrator and, and um, it, uh, we, we accomplished a lot, I think. And I, I totally appreciate the, the effort of the uh, city council in uh, partnering with us with this uh, project. So, um, but I'm in very much a support of, we need to move on and, and how we get there is, is how we need, what we need to decide now, so. Earlier when I should have been asking questions, I was giving an opening statement. Um, uh, so. Our uh, attorneys. Yeah, you know how it is. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the council for all their comments. Uh, I thought they were positive and there's not really that much difference. Maybe the gymnasium is a sticking point somewhere, uh, as it is with the, um, uh, my fellow board members. Um, the, everybody knows I've been an ardent supporter of, of uh, doing this project with the uh, gym. I've stated it before. And the, here, here's a, a practical fact that, can, that can't be denied. We can't even, if we had the dough, could not even fix the Freedom Gym. Because if we do, the school district, will, not our school district, the Oxnard High School District, will come along and suddenly find a need to use the gym more than they already have been, which is almost zero. So... We can't even do that. Other than that particular gym, we have the school gymnasiums, which uh, can change at any time. And we have the recent shooting in Florida, which may change uh, the way security is handled, and it may make it more difficult for scheduling, and uh, oh, on, so on and so forth. I don't know if that will happen or not. But I know it's the, my look into the future is that things will get tighter, uh, not looser. Um, so, yes, I am a guy that says what he means and means what he says, and I've made promises that before I leave my position, uh, subject to, of course, the vote of the uh, population, uh, that I would get the um, Pleasant Valley Fields uh, project uh, to use all my effort to get that done and to supply two gymnasiums, not just one. Now I'm talking about one, but I actually want two. Not in this particular proposal, of course, because I'm also not a pie-in-the-sky guy. I know, I know basically what can get done here. All of the people on, uh, sitting up here pretty much have told us what can get done, and so anybody reading between the lines knows what that is. Um, uh, I uh, uh, certainly agree with Mike's proposal to go back and redo one because I, while I didn't articulate it as well as he did and didn't think about it as much, that's what was in fact missing. Uh, that will kind of put us uh, in, a, in, a, in a lane that yes, maybe we can in fact get this project done. Uh, right now, uh, sitting up here tonight, Despite all of the positive comments and so forth, I still feel a little bit like, wow, you know, <laughs> is this really going to happen? Have, have we worked on all of this up to this time for not? Well, uh, th this, what, the way I feel tonight is not what I promised. And I want to deliver on those promises if I can. And as long as I'm here, that's what I'm going to fight for. Uh, uh, Tony said something earlier that, I th uh, that is almost what I'm going to say right now. The way I look at, at uh, Camarillo, and I've lived here for a long time, I've served on this board for 12 years, uh, I look at it that everybody's the same. I don't look at it really as the city uh, and, and the park district. And before I was on the park district, I even looked at it more so like that. When I pay my taxes, which I pay a ton of taxes as everyone else uh, here tonight does also. I don't really care which um, bank account it goes into. I really don't care because I want certain things done in my city. 
because I want to live in a great city. And I said in my campaign, great parks make great cities. Raises property values, as was mentioned in the study. It, it makes a, a overall better place to live. It keeps people active, healthy, just a ton of different reasons why, why that is true. Uh, but if the, if the end result is, I don't really like the argument about whose money it is, because I consider whosever's money is in whosoever's account is my money. And if I'm a citizen and I want something done, I don't care who pays for it, as long as it's getting paid with my money. And I think that that's what the people out there think. They don't care. It's, oh, it's in my, our account, we don't want to spend this, or it's in this account, they don't, we don't want to spend that. We have needs, they should be met, it doesn't matter whose account it comes out of, in my humble opinion. Uh, now I'm really on my soapbox. Um, at the end of the day, what it looks like we have is maybe a little bit of a disagreement uh, with whether we add the gym onto the project versus not add the gym. And I know that's probably, a pr there's a practical reason for that because it'd be easier to do if we didn't do that. But I think everyone up here should look at it as representing the entire community, not your district, not, your, not our district, but what do the people need and s just dig down, get the job done, and give the people what they, not only what they want, but what they need. And with that, that's all I have. Thank you, Bob. Well, good, only one politician left to talk, and that's me. And I get the benefit. And you have the floor. And I, and I, and I, yeah, and I have the floor, and I get the benefit of all the great ideas that you have, <laughs> you know, which I thank you for. And, and um, I gotta tell you, this is, this, is a, this is a nice treat for me, because this year it's my turn to be chair and to be able to do something this big with you guys and us, it's, it's pretty cool. So thank you. thanks for making it possible. Um, Walt, you didn't come up and speak, but um, you often uh, tell us how uh, we should stop calling them seniors and start calling them over 55, because um, the, you know, people think about senior activities as like, you know, playing bingo and playing cards, but the reality is the range of activities for people over 55 is way broader than that. I've been out to our tennis courts watching a, a really impressive group of 80-year-olds playing tennis three days a week. Uh, you know, out there, active, chasing the ball down, playing competitive games. I've been to, to, the, to the Freedom Gym and watching these old guys bang up against each other playing basketball and, uh, you know, and ping pong. So, you know, we have a lot of active things that seniors do, but we're sort of piecing it and patching it together in different places. And, you know, in thinking about that gym out there, I remember my kids playing there. My, my, kid, my younger son now has a boy in college. And back then the roof, the roof leaked and we had, you know, trash buckets out, you know, so that we could get the game in. So, you know, it, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the thing is ripe to die at any moment and we, and we have no backup plan. We, we, we have nothing. But, you know, we do have some space to put something. And um, I think, uh, you know, Mrs. McDonald, your discussion of phasing is like obvious that, you know, what the next group of work is, is to, okay, what's the urgent part? And what's the important part? And what's the urgent and important part? And you know, I, I remember as a salesperson, always trying to focus my time on the things that are both urgent and important, because there's always all these people coming at you with urgency. But focus on both urgent and important, and then maybe you get to keep your job. So I, you know, the same way here. If we if we can do that, and we have a pretty good sense of what the urgent things are, and and as well as the important things. Um, one thing that didn't get mentioned, but, but I think is worth mentioning here, having this all in a single location saves us a large amount of operating costs because we have a fair amount of employees at, at Burnley that do different things and they overlap amongst all these different activities. So it really works much better operationally as well as, you know, from management, be able to see everything going on in one place. It just works better. And we do have a, I think, big enough facility to support most of the time what we do, I mean, we could, tech, we could absolutely have everything going all at once and, and create some parking problems, but you know, generally you can schedule around that. So I, th I think we're at the place where it is time to come up with, with more options to figure out what we're gonna do and also to have everybody understand 
and I, and I know you, this is the one that people hate the most. Understand things take time. Doing the job right is not doing the job fast. You know, you can have it fast, and you can, it, but you can't have it fast and right. Um, so to make sure that we, you know, we properly decide what it is, we, make, we take this thing and what the first piece is and what, what it's going to cost and how we figure out to pay for it, it's going to take some time. But I think we're off to a really good start here. I, I think we, we do need some more deliverables on, on what, the, what the, the research is going to give us. But I, th I think we are ready to move forward with this thing. And I thank everybody, including you guys, for the process. Does anybody else have anything they need just to say? Just one thing. Um, it's so funny because I'm, I'm around the community all the time. You have Leisure Village Bowling Leagues. You have gymnasiums like I go to. There's more seniors than there are the others at 24-hour fitness during the daytime. It's loaded with seniors, and they aren't young ones. I'm talking about 70s, 80s. Um, golf. There's golf leagues, all seniors. You have card parties. Go to, go to your own place on Monday and watch how many play on Monday. There's a couple days they play cards and other things. There's dancing lessons. That could be with the, with the Moose Lodge or some others that they have dancing lessons. And tons of people show up. It goes on and on how active our seniors are. And this, not even counting Leisure Village stuff. It is a very active Leisure Village that have a lot of activities they're involved in right now. And you guys do sponsor a lot of that activity. Uh, you know, with the softball leagues and all the other stuff. So they're active right now out there. And so I, I just want to let you know, we, we, it's not like we're ignoring them. You're not either. <laughs> they're busy. My comment might be just um, the direction next. Do we send the liaison committee back to fill in some of these blanks that we're hearing and come back with more information, fine-tune it a little bit and see what the next step might be? That's Is that our next... I'd, I'd say absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think we're, we're done with this step of the process yet. So. So that's kind of the direction we'll go in then. Yeah. Is okay. yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Okay, I will adjourn the park district meeting. And I have one comment. I think in all of their surveys, considering there were only 2,000 people answered the questions, and that they were dealing with 10 of us up here, and if. His definition of a senior citizen as being older 55, I don't see a single person up here who uh, is younger than 55. I <laughs> so I think, I think being part of a government agency should be one of your recreational uh, activities. <coughs> With that, oh, you, hey, I, we, we spent all the night till midnight last night together. We're here till 10 o'clock tonight together. This is a recreational facility uh, activity. <laughs> Okay, I'll adjourn the city council meeting. Thank you.